Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Dr. Peter Rogers, and today he's going to be talking about medical reformation. Please welcome him to the show. I'm not sure what that means, Dr. Rogers. Well, the medical reformation means a new way of seeing things. And I think people are going to find it helpful. Okay. I can't wait to see your presentation. Okay. And by the way, I got a little haircut for this, like a monk. I saw a picture of Martin Luther, the monk. I got a picture of Martin Luther on the cover of the book, my new book, Medical Reformation. It doesn't go out of focus, but okay. So you ready for me to show my slides? Absolutely. Okay. Let's go into slideshow here. Can you see the, the big monkey? Monkey with a banana. All right, great. Okay, so as the Lord spoke to the people in parables, let us begin with the story of the zookeeper. And I know some of you have heard this before, but a lot of people haven't. So first, exhibit A is a happy, healthy monkey. Once upon a time, the zookeeper for the herbivore monkeys went on vacation. A medical doctor agreed to moonlight at the zoo. He figured his experience with the talking primates would serve him well. Unbeknownst to the doctor, the new commissary intern had been feeding the monkeys the same diet as the jaguars, known as the jagoff diet. The herbivore monkeys got sick and were too tired to climb the plastic trees in their cage. Paradoxically, the female monkeys seemed happier because the male monkeys were no longer trying to mount them. The MD gave them pill after pill, which slowed things down a little bit, but the monkeys kept getting sicker. It took two pills to control the monkey's high cholesterol and three pills to control the monkey's hypertension. The MD also ordered an endocrine consult for the worsening diabetes. He figured perhaps a continuous glucose monitor with an insulin pump, maybe artificial intelligence, auto-programmable insulin dosing might help. He wisely consulted the cardiac surgeon to evaluate the monkeys for open heart surgery for coronary artery bypass graft, CABG, cabbage. The surgeon went through the standard consent for cabbage with the monkeys, graft occlusion, myocardial infarction, heart attack, chronic arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, permanent pacemaker, automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator, kidney failure, multi-organ failure, cognitive impairment, stroke, death, painful death. The monkey was scheduled for the operating room the next day. And that morning, the zookeeper returned from vacation. The operation was postponed. And the zookeeper put the monkeys back on a plant-based diet. The monkeys came off all their pills and made a full recovery. However, the male monkeys started again trying to mount the female monkeys. One of the female monkeys filed a complaint that the zookeeper was a misogynist. And the zookeeper got fired. Then all the monkeys died. So the question is, who was the zookeeper? Dr. Walter Kempner, the rock star of nutrition. Very popular with the ladies. Okay. Sort of like the Moses of nutrition for the vegan diet and everything. So, you know, just as Moses went to the burning bush and was on Mount Sinai and was given the Ten Commandments, we're going to briefly review the Ten Commandments of nutrition. So here is, you know, him giving the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, starch is a true God of food. Thou shalt put no other foods before starch. And that includes potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, beans, oatmeal, canola, um, eat starch to satisfy your hunger. It's the best way to satisfy hunger. It satisfies hunger with the fewest number of calories. It's like a slow energy release pill as it takes time for the fiber to be separated from the glucose. It's like a polymer of glucose basically wrapped in fiber. Thine brain is a thermostat. We have a set point and your hunger center will just make you eat exactly the amount you do of any given food. So if you want to lose weight, you're not going to do it with eat less and exercise more. That's for chumps. You have to change what you eat and the thermostat will reset itself. The arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Okay. Vegetables are a great source of nutrients. Fruits are also good. If you're young and you exercise a lot, you can get away with eating lots of fruit. I know there's lots of really healthy vegans that eat tons of fruit and I've, I've seen them. Okay. But if a person is not exercising that much, then they got to be a little careful because it doesn't satisfy hunger as well. And you can overeat with the fruits. Okay. Plants provide what you need to spread your seed. You, you know, vegans are just better looking, okay? Because they got better blood perfusion of their skin. They have this glow of vitality about them. Their arteries stay open better and that gives them more energy so they can exercise more, okay? Basically all the stuff you want to open up an artery, it's in plants. You got potassium and magnesium. Those are vasodilators. You've got the nitrate precursors and nitric oxide. 
vasodilator, okay? And then also, uh, you got more antioxidants to prevent the problems and detoxify stuff. Um, it's a, it's not just a diet. It's a way of life. You, you don't just eat this for one day. You got to eat healthy food every day. It's very sustainable. It's very pleasant. Um, let's see, thou shalt not eat meat. Meat tends to make you fat because all meat is high in fat. Uh, even a so-called low meat, low fat meat is typically at least like 25% fat. A classic food is like salmon, 50% fat, 50% protein. So you're not going to win with that. Vegan diet typically ends you up at about 80, 10, 10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% protein, 10% fat. That's rather typical. Okay. Cheese is just meat jello. When you eat it, you look like the animal it came from. A pizza, like a cheese pizza, it looks the same in your plate as it does in your arteries. That's what atherosclerosis looks like on gross you know, inspection. Okay, meat also increases your risk of leaky gut, xenocyanitis, inflammation, cancer, autoimmune disease, all this bad stuff. Lack of fiber increases constipation, abdominal pressure syndrome, et cetera. Okay, thou shalt not eat oils. Oils are liquid fat. They're toxic. They're not even a food. Um, they're cancer promoters. They, cause leaky, they can cause leaky gut. They're bad. Okay, and I would also say everybody wants to put something on your dressing. If you put anything, put a little vinegar or something. You don't don't ever put salad oil. That's that's uh, not a good thing to eat. You look, and I also say skip the dressing, and you'll look better undressed. Um, thou shalt not commit adultery with junk food and fast food. See, once you recognize that stuff is toxic, you don't want to eat it. You also start to become grossed out by it. Uh, so then that helps you to avoid it. If if in your mind's eye you think, oh, I'm missing out on all this enjoyment. Like I've had people say to me at a party or a wedding, oh, don't you want to enjoy life? And I'm like, you know, being fat and sick doesn't sound like an enjoyable way to go through life to me. Um, thou shalt not bear false witness against the vegan diet. There's two kingdoms of food. The vegan kingdom is sort of like the land of healthy people. If you look at epidemiology, it's pretty convincing. You know, you got sample sets of millions and billions. Okay, the people eating these, you know, plant-based diets, 95% or more, they're skinny and healthy. The people eating meat, oil, processed food, all this modern stuff, they're fat and sick. Okay, like the Nauru, the Pima, most Americans. And then people say, well, what about vegans who are fat? Well, I would say those are philosophic vegans who don't pay attention to the nutrition quality of the food they're eating. They eat a lot of nuts, oil, sweets, and seeds. Um, and I call that the siren song of philosophic vegans. There's also religious vegans like the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, I'm what you would call a health vegan. I just want to be healthy. Okay. I would eat meat if, if I thought it would make me healthy again. Okay. Um, anyways, let's see. I recommend sort of an orthodox veganism. The way I say it, the reason I go to that is because I believe, and I've seen it, the people who really change, make a big change, they get a big improvement. The people who say to me, well, I'm just cutting down a little. I'm cutting down a little on meat. I'm cutting down on oil. I've seen a lot of patients like that with diabetes, uh, AFib and other problems. They don't tend to get better. The ones who completely go 100%, they get much better results. You know, and the example has been made, if you had an alcoholic, you don't tell them you could drink on the weekend. You say, don't drink anymore. Same thing with a smoker, you don't smoke on the weekends, okay? It's like if you buy a car, a sports car, and it says put premium gas in it, you put premium gas in it. If you don't, you put regular gas in that, it's always gonna have problems. And no medical surgical BS is going to change that until you put premium gas in the car. And your body's like a car, except it has to last your whole life. So you should be even more careful with it than what you put in your car. And I think the proper attitude is an attitude of gratitude. You know, all I got to do is eat these plant foods and I don't have to be fat, sick and stupid like most people. I mean, that's a great deal. Sort of like Dean Warmer, you know, in Animal House said the flounder. He said, you know, fat, fat, drunk and stupid is no way to go through life. And I can tell you, most people go through life fat, sick, and then they're cognitively impaired, like by 55 or 60. You know, like I said, I got my internal medicine friends and my own personal experience. Most of the people I see over 60 are cognitively quite slow, kind of cow-like. Yes, please. Thank you. They're nice. But, you know, I don't want, you know, to be brain slowed down like that. Can't remember anything. Okay, so... Johnson keeps working better as well. Don't covet thy neighbor's plate of all this junk food. It's not going to do you any good. All right. Oh, and now here I'm going to talk to, this is talking about the medical reformation and what can be done to improve medicine. And I'm going to tell you, I think that this is the most important painting ever made, that God created man in his own image. Therefore, man is part divine as well as part beast. And this is a big deal because I think the big problem in, in healthcare nowadays is ethics. And what I mean by that is, what United States currently goes by, the entire medical system, the entire college system, for example, I majored in evolutionary biology at Stanford when I was in college, and you're basically taught atheistic Darwinism. And there's a lot of problems with it. I know the science very well as an A-plus student in it, okay? No one can explain the origin of life. No one can truly explain the, um, the origin of complexity in living creatures. You know, all of a sudden, everything occurred at the Cambrian. And the point I'm saying is, 
when you say that man is part divine, you raise the significance of the individual. And Ayn Rand had said basically the same thing. The smallest minority is the individual. If you guarantee individual rights, everything else follows from that. And what I believe is the problem in healthcare is when you use this uh, atheistic Darwinism definition of a man, that he's just a talking monkey, a talking primate. He has no soul. There is nothing special about him. There's nothing unique about him. Or what you're basically saying, he's not entitled to anything. And when you go down that path, it makes money the primary goal rather than helping the person. You have to say, this person is so important that I will do whatever is right for them despite the money. And believe me, there's big money to be made by, by de devaluing the patient. Okay. And so I think that it's either going to go down that path or it's never going to get better is my opinion based on a lot of experience. Humans are designed to eat plants, you know, right from the beginning, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden here. Genesis 129 said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, which has fruit, it shall be food for you. Our physiology is designed to eat plants. Uh, that's been, you know, shown and discussed at length. Okay. Uh, here's a quote from Martin Luther. The simplest peasant with scripture knows more than the Pope without it. Uh, this painting is of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms uh, when he had to go before Charles V, the whole emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And, you know, pretty big stuff. And so I would say with this medical reformation, it means the simplest peasant with low fat vegan diet can save more patients than the head of Harvard Hospital without it. And that's true because the vegan diet is the most powerful thing in all medicine. I'm board certified in three fields, first in my class, all that stuff. And I can tell you, there is nothing anywhere remotely as powerful as the low fat vegan diet. That's why you want to learn about it. Look at Esselstyn, Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, put 198 patients on a low fat vegan diet and he has the best results by far of any other study ever in the history of the world. The closest thing to it was like the Lyon study, an optimized version of the Mediterranean diet. And I remember him being about like at least 30 times better than that in terms of his outcomes. 99.4% of the patients, no recurrent um, cardiovascular events. That was a uh, journal of family practice, July, 2014. It's available at his site, drrestleston.com. Okay, so here's another quote from Martin Luther. I do not accept the authority of popes and councils for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. And Martin Luther's haircut here, it's called the monk tonsure. I got, I got the same thing. That's, that's how I have one of my friends said, why don't you try getting one of those hair, haircuts it's like a monk? It'd be funny. All right. Um, and like I said, you learning about the low fat vegan diet will have more ability to cure yourself or a friend of chronic disease than any of these Ivy League schools. All right, this is my book. Here's the front cover, the back cover. I basically corrected all the medical books. And Chef AJ is part of the one who motivated me, me to do this. I was talking to Chef AJ and she asked me, so what, what have you been thinking about lately? What's new with you? I said, well, I've noticed all the medical books. They're all wrong. It's like every single chapter says the same thing. Not this disease. Nobody knows the cause, but it's associated with aging. It seems to be, you know, at least partly genetic. Uh, so, you know, what we recommend, just, you know, take our pill and try to slow it down a little bit. That's like almost every chapter on the major common diseases. And then I start going through the vegan literature, nutrition literature, toxicology literature, epidemiology literature, and it's all wrong. So Chef AJ said to me, well, why don't you rewrite the textbook? So that's what I've done. I've basically taken everything that should be in these books and it'll never get put in there because there's no money in it. And I've added it in. I didn't copy. I didn't repeat all the basic intro stuff that you can find in any medical book or physiology, biochemistry book. But I put all the stuff that should be in there that's not in there. It's in there. OK, and the, the other thing I would say is nutrition and health is kind of going through what I would call its own renaissance. OK, you go to channel. I go to Chef AJ's channel. You can find all this information for free. And the information is better than you're going to find on books. You get more pictures when you look at a, at a slideshow talk um, and you can contrast everything. So it's rather unique. And I also see just like during the Renaissance, everyone was competing to see who could make the best um, paintings, for example, frescoes and whatnot. Nowadays, people are sort of competing to see who can provide the best information. So I think it's a wonderful time for learning about this stuff. You know, you can watch all these videos and learn a lot and it's free. I mean, that's a good deal. Here is the Tower of Babel, sort of like Babylon, the prototype for evil in the Bible. Okay. And I said, conventional medical textbooks on the common diseases all say the same thing. I went through that. Each disease is the cause is unknown. That means idiopathic. And I joke that idiopathic means the doctor's an idiot and the patient's pathetic. Okay. And, you know, MD means medications are drugs. And basically the philosophy is 
match the ill to the pill and send a bill. Okay, so the painting is Tower of Babel by Bruegel. All right, and then what basically happens when a patient's put on a med for chronic disease, they have to take that med for the rest of their life. Every day, the rest of their life, they're never cured. And I said, they, they like become a cow that's milked every day by the medical system. And, you know, sometimes you have to take a medicine, but most people taking pills, they do it because they're chumps. They could cure themselves pretty easy if they had, had gotten their acts together, if they were motivated. You know, I have a lot of people, like I'll tell them something, they come to ask me for advice. And I'll tell them, well, do this, do this. You'd have to become a low fat vegan. They go, oh, well, he's not going to do that. Or I'm not going to do that. I'd rather die than stop eating meat and all this stuff. You're going to take away my ice cream. Um, or my uncle, he would never do that. And I'm like, well, it's his life. He can do whatever he wants. I'll just give you information. You can take it or leave it. Okay, this is just showing you know, what happens with starch. It's a polymer of glucose uh, wrapped in fiber. And the stomach, first of all, is stretched. That provides early satisfaction of hunger. Then it goes into the intestinal tract. The enzymes have to peel the fiber off from the glucose. So you get a slow release of glucose and you stay with a normal blood glucose for a prolonged amount of time or just a mild elevation of it. Kind of like this curve right here, the glucose. And that's exactly what you want after eating. Prandial means eating, so post-prandial. If you eat a lot of simple sugars, like one of these energy drinks, there's no fiber in it, tons of sugar, you'll spike your blood glucose. The pancreas tends to overcompensate and it drives your blood glucose down kind of rapidly. That's rebound hypoglycemia. You don't want that. You can feel lightheaded and kind of lousy for that. You can get scintillating scotomata, headaches, et cetera. Okay, so anyways, starch is great because early satisfaction of hunger and prolonged secondary delayed satisfaction of hunger. Okay, uh, let's see what else here. I, I'd actually say this is the most important thing I ever learned. I've been a doctor over 30 years. The most important thing I ever learned in life is that uh, if you want humans to be healthy, feed them a high percent of their calories from starch. And this is, here's a good Dr. McDougall quote. All longstanding healthy populations eat a starch-based diet. There are no exceptions. Metabolically, we're, we're designed to run on starch, like I just showed you, because you, know, you got all the other good things in the plant. You got the fiber, you got the antioxidants, you got the potassium, you got the uh magnesium that's all good and you got the nitrate precursors everything you want okay then here's kind of how it plays out oh there was part of my slide I didn't get on here i thought i fixed this slide oh maybe it's the next one let me see if it's the next one yeah it's on this next one all right so what this shows here now is you basically you know take your pick this is you in the map okay you could go down this path right here of uh well here's what most people do they keep on eating meat and processed food and oil and all this stuff. They keep getting fatter and sicker. And then they uh, pull this thing out of here. Then they uh, get drug, drug, drug. That's the treatment for everything. You know, a fat 55 year old walks into your office as a doctor. You put them on pills for hypertension, for, you know, elevated cholesterol, for prediabetes, et cetera, et cetera. It just keeps adding up. Then there's a side effect. Give them a pill for that. Then the pills don't work that well long term. So you, you take them to the operating room, chop, 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 bye-bye money, gets real expensive, dead prematurely, okay? And so I would call this man's way of doing things. It's expensive, it's painful, and it seldom works, okay? And then up here, I'll call this God's way of doing things. It's free, and it usually works. Why wouldn't you want it? Low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, I would even push it even a little further, low-protein vegan diet, uh, no oil, alcohol, no MJ, uh, no sweets. Uh, also, you know, you want to avoid toxins. That's kind of a topic for another day, but that's relevant also. If you can, try, try to eat organic. Uh, try to avoid other toxins to the extent you can. Uh, EMF, I've given lectures on that previously. That's becoming more and more relevant. Do all these other things that affect the quality of your life. Get your sleep every night. Try to get your exercise, your sunshine, good social relationships, be doing something positive to help other people. Religion makes a lot of people other healthy. You know, the modern world tries to deny that. And uh, like I said, to go into that atheistic Darwinistic devaluation of mankind and humans, say man has no soul. If you look at our super tentorial cortex, we got a brain like three times as big as a chimp. We're way beyond chimps. This idea of us being just like chimps, that's not correct. Okay, and then it reminds me what a lot of people run into is this idea here, like Dante. He said, in middle age, I found myself in a dark wood and the path was lost. So, you know, we have all this fun when we're young and then we get married, start having to commute to a job and everything else that goes with that. We're sleep deprived and all of a sudden we get fat and sick. I'm trying to turn my, uh, I got this pen thing on here. I didn't mean to turn the pen on. Let's see if I can turn the pen off somehow. Okay. 
You mean like where your cursor is? Yeah, yeah. It turned into a pen for some reason. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I, I clicked the button. Okay, I think I think I did it with that. All right. And so what I'm saying is, you know, you find yourself in midlife. Uh-oh, I'm sick. I'm fat. What do I do now? And then you go to conventional medicine. And this is Dante with Virgil, you know, walking up to the gates of hell. And the sign on top of the gates of hell said, abandon hope, all ye who enter. And that's essentially what conventional medicine says. It says, these are chronic diseases. We cannot cure them. Just take this pill and hopefully slow it down. And if it doesn't work, we'll operate on you. <laughs> okay, so Martin Luther felt that things were not being done the way they should be. So in 1517, on the door of the church in Wittenberg, he nailed his 95 theses. Okay, topics for debate. So I thought there's a lot of things in medicine that are not as they should be. So I'm going to write some of these theses, but I only wrote 25 of them. I think that's enough. I think if I wrote any more than that, you'd go crazy. I would too. Okay, so theses number one, why do internists treat atherosclerosis with pills, which has a 0% cure rate when low-fat vegan with no oils, Esselstyn diet, has a 99 plus percent cure rate? Why do cardiologists treat coronary artery disease with stents, which has a near 0% cure rate. It can save your life in the middle of a heart attack, but most stents are not placed in the middle of a heart attack. They're placed for chronic, you know, like cardiac angina with stenosis. And the stent doesn't increase the longevity of the patient. Typically what it does though, it can reduce their symptoms, you know, by opening up the diameter of that part of the artery. But the problem with atherosclerosis, it's diffused, it's everywhere. It's not just in the one tight stenosis, it's diffused through the coronary and it's also, it stems into the intramyocardial branches, okay? And you can't stent these little tiny branches. Okay, uh, why do surgeons treat chronic coronary artery disease with open heart surgery? Again, virtually 0% cure rate when low-fat vegans got 99 plus percent cure rate. Okay, uh, most cardiologists and vascular surgeons, cardiac surgeons, vascular interventionalists, they don't even know that atherosclerosis is a blood clot. And what I'm trying to say is when I was a young guy, I was a vascular interventionalist, interventional radiologist, imaging guided surgeon. I thought, you know, we're the real atherosclerosis doctors. You know, I used to hang around with cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, and vascular surgeons. I thought, we're the best experts on atherosclerosis and atherosclerosis-related disease. But I've totally changed my opinion on that. Now, I think those guys, my previous self included, we were basically plumbers. So a plumber deals with a, a blockage. You know, there's a narrowing in the artery, the medical word stenosis. And you say, well, how can I open that up? I can put a balloon in there, an angioplasty. Maybe I'll get a longer-term result if I put a stent in there. I could try an atherectomy. Um, why don't we just do a surgical bypass? We've got good outflow. You know, you're in a large proximal vessel. Fine. All right. But they don't really pay attention to what's going on with the vessel. And in addition, they are forced by their field to kind of go with the flow. What I mean by that is if you're a cardiologist, you can't say stents stink. They're a ripoff. I would never get one because all the other cardiologists, you know, they boot you out of town. Same thing if you're an open heart cardiothoracic surgeon. You can't say surgery is a lousy procedure. <laughs> you know, everybody, they would hate you. They won't let you work at their hospital, okay? So, whereas a pathologist is the best expert at uh, atherosclerosis, they just look under a microscope and they go, it's a blood clot, <laughs> okay? And, you know, the real famous pathologist, I'll actually show their, their work a little bit in a moment. We're going to come to it. So, and the other thing is all these guys, they don't know anything about hemorrhagology, atherothrombosis, circulating endothelial precursor cells typically, they really don't know that much about atherosclerosis. You would be surprised, okay? And I kind of joke, like a basketball player not knowing how to dribble, okay? A baseball player not knowing how to pitch and catch. All right, so now here is the best book ever written on atherosclerosis. It's by Gregory Sloop, MD. He's the pioneer of the atherothrombosis theory. And you really need to start getting into hemorrheology if you're going to make sense of atherosclerosis and accept the fact that it's a blood clot. Once you do that, all these other things will follow. Cause I was real interested in atherosclerosis and I was having a hard time making sense out of it till I went through atherothrombosis theory. Atherothrombosis theory is sort of comprehensive. It includes everything, cholesterol theory and all this other stuff. Okay, here's another real famous pathologist. This is William Roberts. He wrote this landmark paper of over 2000 autopsies on patients who died for uh, conditions related to coronary artery disease, either you know sudden death, myocardial infarction or arrhythmia thought to be due to ischemia, lack of blood flow. Uh, here's some interesting things that he says. When you feed herbivore animals a high fat diet, they all get atherosclerosis, every single one of them. That's why I think cardiac calcium CT is kind of a joke. Why check for something? You already know you got it. If you ate the high fat diet all these years, you got atherosclerosis. You don't need to look at your calcium. I realize some patients, they can't understand the conversation about cholesterol levels and all this other stuff, but they can recognize the calcium and that freaks them out and that motivates them. 
Um, and until that point, you can't sort of get through to them. Okay, Roberts goes on. Cholesterol is by far the most important risk factor for developing atherosclerosis. And that's relevant because there's a lot of people on the internet trying to pretend cholesterol is not a risk factor. That was shown long, long ago, you know, by Ansel Keys, okay, back in the 1950s. All right, William Roberts. And the 1960s, William Roberts, uh, single vessel coronary artery disease is a myth. So in all these autopsy patients, what he found was it's never isolated to a single vessel. And the relevance of that is sometimes we'll say, we're just going to bypass this vessel. We're just going to stent this one vessel. He, what he said is it's always diffuse of a similar severity everywhere. And typically the tight stenosis that gets stented or bypassed is not the one that goes on to rupture, you know, ruptured plaque, so to speak, and cause a focal thrombosis, clotting that occludes the artery and cause a myocardial infarction. So you can't even see the one that's going to eventually cause the myocardial infarction. So, you know, that's part of getting back to why CV surgery and stenting is overrated compared to what people think it is. All right, next thesis. Number four, why do doctors treat type 2 diabetes with pills that have a 0% cure rate when you can usually cure it Almost all the time, if you catch it early, while they still got good uh, insulin production out of their beta cells in the pancreas, okay, how come the endocrinologists have not read the basic paper? I was interested in what causes dementia. This was many years ago, and I asked, you know, my local internal medicine friends, who's the best endocrinologist, diabetes experts? I want to talk to them because I'm trying to understand some things about dementia causation, and I thought maybe they could help me. I reviewed all the papers, the books, everything, so I'd be prepared to speak to them. And then when I went to talk to them, I said, what do you think about the Sweeney paper? They go, oh. Not familiar with that. Hemsworth paper, Rabinowitz, Brownlee, Shulman paper, uh, Roy Taylor paper. They hadn't read any of the papers. And I'm like, how could these guys be the experts? These were the, the best endocrinologists, fellowship trained experts in diabetes. And they're the ones who train all the fellows. And so what I realized was they're the experts in all the drugs. They know every permutation of drug or continuous glucose monitor you could imagine. But they really had no interest in understanding diabetes. <laughs> they make money selling drugs for diabetes, okay? Um, and everybody, you know, sort of in the regular world, they not in the vegan nutrition world, they think it's a carbohydrate disease. And they put these pa patients on high fat diets, which is really stupid, because the main cause of insulin resistance is eating a high fat diet. Okay, now here's a couple of interesting things. Let's start with these guys first, mastering diabetes, Bobby Bittero and Cyrus Kumbata. And he had, you know, type, di type he calls it type one, maybe it's type one, maybe it's 1.5, I kind of wonder. But anyways, he had diabetes and he went and got a PhD in nutrition so he could figure out how to help himself. And he noticed, he goes, gosh, whenever in these animal studies, they wanted to cause diabetes in the animal, they would feed them fat, you know, especially saturated fat. But he says, if we if we cause diabetes in animal by feeding them fat, doesn't it make sense that we probably shouldn't be doing that with humans? Okay, so I thought that was kind of funny. Here is uh, Life Without Diabetes. This is a book by Roy Taylor. He won the Banting Award in 2012 as best diabetes researcher in the world. And what he discovered was, I think I'll have a slide of it later, but uh, low fat well, actually, I'll get to it when I get to the slide. But again, reducing body weight really helped a lot with diabetes patients. All right, number five, thesis number five. Why do doctors treat hypertension with pills that have a 0% cure rate when it can usually be cured with a low-fat vegan diet? And how come medical students are not taught that high-fat, high-sodium diets cause hypertension and plants prevent it? Okay, high-fat diets, you know, they cause the red blood cells to stick together, uh, like a reload formation or blood sludge. The chylomicrons do that. LDL cholesterol does that. Sodium inhibits endothelial and nitric oxide production, the vasodilator, so you don't want to be eating that. Plants provide all the good stuff, potassium, magnesium, and nitrate precursors of nitric oxide. Those are all your vasodilators. Vasodilator means dilates the artery to keep it open. Um, the other thing, too, is you go to pathology books, they're going to tell you 95% of hypertension is essential, meaning of unknown cause. Same old story. Take our pill and slow it down, just like they do for coronary artery disease, just like they do for diabetes and for autoimmune disease, most other things. All right, um, epidemiology, vegan nutrition books, you know, they cure these patients left and right. Okay, so here's the famous Walter Kempner book. This one is written by Barbara Newborg, and she's a physician who worked with him. And um, so it's actually a very good book. She um, goes through a lot of the medical stuff. She kind of talks about all the personal family social relationships too, but uh, she goes into pretty good detail on, on the medical stuff. Plus his book is at Dr. McDougall's website if you want to see his research paper. I went through them, they're pretty extraordinary. You know, Dr. McDougall had said he's probably the greatest doctor who ever lived. Kempner was a genius, okay? He had worked with Otto Warburg, who won the Nobel Prize for um, biochemistry in 1931, and who discovered the Warburg effect, and that led to the whole metabolic theory of cancer and all that, which is fascinating, good stuff. Okay, here's the best book ever written specifically about hypertension with regard to electrolytes and sodium. Um, it's called The High Blood Pressure Solution. Author's name is Richard Moore, and the gist of it is that 
I actually, I might have a slide or two on this, and I've talked about it at length in a bunch of other lectures, but there's very good reasons. When you eat processed food and meat most of the time, you end up with very high sodium intake and very low potassium intake. When you eat a plant-based diet, it's the opposite. High potassium intake, low sodium intake. And that's exactly what you want. Our ancestors probably ate about 25 times more uh, potassium than sodium versus modern people tend to eat like 10 or 15 times more sodium than potassium. They got everything flipped. And your body can only keep so many positively charged uh, ions, you know, cations. And so when you eat lots of sodium, you're going to void out in your urine a lot of your potassium. And it's not good. You're going to be hypertensive. Okay, surgeons don't know the most basic stuff about how do you improve blood flow, which is a pretty big deal because if you want to heal a wound, you need good blood flow. They really ought to know this, but they don't. It's not their fault. It never gets taught to them. So what happens is medical students, and uh, residents and fellows are all tested for their board's exam based on what's in the textbooks. But the most useful information never gets to the textbooks. I call it NET, N-E-T, Nutrition, Epidemiology, Toxicology. It's not in any of the books, okay? Um, I, like I said, I'm, I'm boarding in three studies, three fields. I was 99% of my boards. I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't learn any of this stuff until after I got fat in my 30s and my mother had cancer and my father had coronary artery disease. Then I started to read outside and I started learning all these things. I was like, why wasn't I taught this in my training. Okay, so anyways, good video at Dr. McDougall's uh, YouTube channel and where he talks about you eat a high fat meal, you get blood cells, red blood cells stick together. I'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, I kind of joke, you know, like the old proverb. Uh, here it is, fear of ischemia means lack of blood flow is the beginning of health wisdom. Every doctor should be trained in how do you improve blood flow? And it's pretty simple. Avoid high fat food and avoid sodium, okay? Eat plant food to get all the potassium, magnesium and nitrates. All right. All right. Now here's something like from Dr. Burkett and they don't know. These are abdominal surgeons. I've talked to them. I talked to their attendings. The senior attending is the one who trained all the senior residents. All right. Okay. The one who are the experts that everybody goes to, they don't know this stuff. And it's pretty basic. Fiber pulls water into the stool. So the stool is liquid. Initially, it should be liquid on the right side of the abdomen. If you eat a lot of meat and oil, with there's no fiber in that stuff and processed food, very little fiber you get dry stool on the right side of the colon and it can precipitate and form little stones. You call them lithmine stones. So fecal lith means uh, stone of feces, okay? It's also called an appendical lith, meaning a stone in the appendix. And that'll obstruct the appendix. The more distal mucous glands will continue to secrete their mucus. So the appendix will swell up and then pop and that's appendicitis, okay? So uh, plant eaters get much less appendicitis. The other thing is, you know, normal uh, defecation should be like a cow patty. Uh, versus if a person is eating, you know, mostly meat, processed food and whatnot and oils, they then will have very dried out stool and they're going to be defecating with, you know, goat pellets and Tootsie Rolls and they're going to be constipated. They're going to strain at the abdomen. It's called a valsalva maneuver. So daily straining with valsalva maneuver creates back pressure in the abdomen. So this is called abdominal pressure syndrome as described by Dennis Burke in the 1960s. That will have pressure downward causing rectums, rectal hemorrhoids, It'll have pressure into the leg, causing varicose veins, pressure on the stomach, pushing the stomach up into the chest a little bit. Typically, it's small, a hiatal hernia, can have gastroesophageal reflux, GERD, uh, but it can be a big. I see an entire stomach herniated into the uh, chest from this. Not good, because then it can compress the posterior surface of the heart. You don't want that. The back pressure going into the sigmoid colon can cause outpouchings um, of the bowel wall. That's called, called diverticulosis, and all the patients have that. Okay, you look at uh, CT scans of patients in the USA, most of them will have that after 45 years of age. Um, I, I actually spoke with a doctor, he's from Iran of all places, and he said to me, he goes, in my country, we don't have any diverticulosis. I go, what are you talking about? He says, lots of fiber. He says, nobody gets diverticulosis. He says, I'm not used to seeing it on a CAT scan. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. All right, so anyways, in America, almost everybody has it, all right? If one of those diverticuli pops, you get diverticulitis, inflammation of the of the fat around the sigmoid colon, the mesenteric fat, it's diverticulitis. In Western hospitals, you know, at least one patient gets admitted every week for that. Usually multiple patients get admitted every week. Okay, inguinal hernia, because you're also pushing the bowel through weaknesses in the fascia at different weak spots, you know, periumbilical or inguinal like this right here. Um, and the other thing too is it can, it can cause infertility because you get back pressure on the veins in the scrotum and they will enlarge, become varicoceles, kind of like varicose veins. And those can heat up the testicles, decrease sperm production. So constipation can cause infertility. 
All right, here's a little bit about what this is all about with regard to red blood cells. Red blood cells have a negative charge on their outer surface. You know, the negative charge is from sialic acids, from cholesterol sulfates, from heparin sulfates, you know, the glycocalyx, it has a negative charge. And that's good because they repel each other. And actually the arterial lining, the endothelium, it's glycocalyx also has a negative charge, a zeta potential. It's called the negative charge in the outer surface of a cell is called zeta potential. And it's exactly what you want so that they don't stick together. You know, on TV movies, you say, oh, he bled to death. Okay. In real life, almost nobody bleeds to death. Everybody clots to death. Okay. A clot in the heart is a heart attack, most common cause of death. A clot in the brain is a stroke. And then even cancer is thought to be primarily due to a lack of blood supply to a tissue, which is causing initiation of a Warburg effect. Okay. Ischemia induced transformation of the cell to become like an anaerobic bacteria, switching off its aerobic metabolism because it doesn't have enough oxygen and there's mitochondrial injury from the lack of oxygen and subsequently relying on a primitive pathway, retroverting to become like an anaerobic bacteria. That's the Warburg effect, then runs on glycolysis. That's why you do a PET scan. Cancer cells take up like 100 times more glucose than a regular cell. Okay, well, anyways, getting back to the zeta potential, the negative charges repel each other, all right? So they bounce off of each other like bumper cars, all right? And there are molecules called bridging molecules that stick them together. And you don't want that because that's what kills people again. And what does it? LDL cholesterol. That's why LDL cholesterol is a risk factor and actually the most important risk factor that's controllable for coronary artery disease. All right. Also, IgM antibodies. IgM antibodies are elevated in the acute setting of infection. They will also do this. All right. Uh, fibrinogen, which is a blood clotting protein. Um, that's a big bridging molecule, of course. That's why it's a clotting protein. Uric acid, which can be elevated by ingesting large amounts of high fructose corn syrup, will do it. And there's one little thing. I didn't have it on the slide, but actually, if you have leaky gut, you'll postprandial, I mean, after eating, you'll get increased uh, bacterial endotoxin. So the gram-negative bacteria is like um, LPS, gram-positive bacteria is LTA, it's endotoxin. Those will distort the shape of the fibrinogen and they'll do something, it's called an amyloid transformation where it changes from being an alpha helix to beta pleated sheet and it stacks up. The whole point is they, they make it hyperthrombotic, much more thrombotic, much more difficult to lyse. It's bad. You don't want leaky gut, not just for autoimmune disease, but also because it's a prothrombotic condition, increasing your risk of myocardial infarction and other you know, problems, okay, like stroke and all that stuff. All right, uh, red blood cells, about seven microns, capillaries, about five microns. You, actually, you want to remember this. So seven microns, red blood cell, typical diameter, uh, capillary, typical diameter of about five microns. The relevance is that in order to pass through, so let's imagine that this is a red blood cell and it wants to pass through the capillary. It has to fold back on itself. So instead of coming in full, it's going to have to fold back to get in there. And what I'm saying is if something stiffens that red blood cell, which happens when the red blood cells are stuck together because the bridging molecules holding them together, like the LDL cholesterol, the fibrinogen clotting protein, the acute infection, um, IgM antibodies. Now it's almost like pushing a submarine sandwich through that um, capillary. So the blood pressure has to go up and the high blood pressure is gonna actually damage arteries as well. So I'm just showing how these problems just start to cascade upon each other, okay? And if you have high sodium, you constrict the blood vessel. It narrows down. So then you, again, you need higher pressure. I mean, what's the point of blood pressure? To get blood to the top of your head, the top of your brain, you're pumping against gravity. That's the hardest spot to pump to. And basically normal blood, let's say it's kind of like water. All right, that's relatively easy to pump with wide open arteries. But once you, you know, eat the sodium, you constrict the arteries. Now you got to pump hard to get through a tight system. Once you eat a high fat meal, you start sticking these red blood cells together then they become thicker. The blood becomes thicker. It's like you're pumping a milkshake instead of pumping water. Pressure has to go up, okay? All right, this is just showing peak lipemia. This is a study done by Peter Quo, cardiologist in Pennsylvania, you know, back in the 1950s. He took a bunch of patients like uh, with a uh, high saturated fat intake and he found that these are all patients that had cardiac angina and he would test their blood every 30 minutes for the amount of lipids in their blood. And after they ate a meal, it was typically around, you know, about three hours to about seven or eight hours when they had peak lipemia in the blood, they would get episodes of chest pain due to cardiac angina. That means pain due to ischemia, lack of blood flow. So it totally correlated with the lipids. And then people thought, well, in the 1960s, they go, well, maybe unsaturated fat, you know, like all these cooking oils are going to be a great way to replace saturated fat in the diet. But what they found was they were even worse. They called even more blood sludge effect. And that would go on for hours late into the evening. And the technologists working in the lab were kind of getting annoyed because they wanted to go home. They'd started at eight o'clock in the morning. 
and you're eight o'clock at night and you still have a high level of blood lipemia and these patients have an anginal episodes, chest pain episodes. So that's a pretty good correlation right there. Okay, um, how come medical schools don't teach nutrition or toxicology or epidemiology? Those are three most important things. Okay, med school education and pre-med education is kind of a big joke, okay? Um, biochem books rec re routinely recommend high fat diets like the Mediterranean diet. And I'm saying it's so stupid. It's like treating lung cancer patients with cigarettes, all right? It's like sending syphilis patients to a brothel for treatment. It's stupid, okay? I got news for you. All doctors are hardworking. There's no such thing as a doc doctor that's not a hard worker because you, you would get booted out. I mean, a doctor's job is all some bean counter saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You get booted out if you didn't do a ton of work every day and generate your share of the billing codes, all right? But a lot of doctors are kind of stupid and they'll conform with anything. You tell them anything. Okay, got it, standard of care, got it. Because they know if they follow the standard of care, they can't get in trouble. Even if the patient dies as a terrible outcome, so what? They don't get sued. They can't get sued. They follow the standard of care. All right. So there's a, and then the standard of care is typically give them a drug, which is fast. So the bean counter is on their case. You need to be more productive. How many patients you see in a day? So-and-so saw 30 patients yesterday. You only saw 20. What's wrong with you? You need to get your act together, get your numbers up, or we're going to have to let you go. So they have to go real fast. Standard of care is fast. Give the drug. Can't get in trouble. Um, you get paid. Insurance company won't pay you for talking to a patient and educating them. They'll pay you for giving them a drug. Okay, the, the biochemistry books, they all ignore toxicology. I'll talk about that later, but you know, I would find things like I knew mitochondrial inhib inhibition was a problem in the brain. I go through all my biochemistry books and I own like seven of them. And there wasn't anything about in inhibitors. And then I started looking through the literature. I real quickly found 50 mitochondrial inhibitors. I'll talk about that later. Okay, and medical students are also taught that it's basically impossible to cure these chronic diseases. Nothing you could do hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, autoimmune. And they, they're basically, they're trained in learned helplessness that you can't do anything. And that's why I joke the motto of an allopathic medical school, which is most medical schools, um, there's also GOs, doctors of osteopathy, which are basically the same thing. Yeah, they do a little bit of spine manipulation, but not much. They still prescribe the same drugs and do the same, follow the same guidelines. Okay, they say, we, we're the best. We never cure a patient. We never cure anyone of a chronic disease. We always lose, it's like a sports team saying, we always lose, but we're the best. I mean, could you imagine a sports team bragging that they always lose? They always fail to cure the patient. It's kind of ridiculous. Okay. And they don't teach patient about anything taboo. Oh gosh, you can't speak about religion or anything like that. Anything and anything. You're not going to talk about all this other stuff too. They don't learn nutrition, toxicology, epidemiology, how to manage stress, all that stuff. All right. Um, and here, Dr. McDougall, look, you never heard of McDougall, McDougall, all of them, Chef AJ, Esselstyn, Pritikin, you name them, Ornish, Burkett, none of them are in any of the textbooks. None of, I've never seen any of their names ever in any of the books. And they'll never will because there's no money in this stuff, okay? And, you know, if you want to learn, get introduced, introduced to nutrition, Start Solution is a great book. One of the best introduction to nutrition books, probably the best one you can find. You want to lose weight, Chef AJ's got the best book on how to lose weight. You know, she's figured the whole thing out with the caloric density and all the other stuff. If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. All that stuff's what you need to know. Okay, here's the thing on mitochondria inhibitors. So nothing in the med school books, you know, undergraduate biochemistry books or med school biochemistry books. You go through the paper, over 50 things real quick. And they're real common. Statins. <laughs> like I've had these um, senior attendings say, Pete, do you think I should take metformin? I've heard that it increases longevity. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're going to take a mitochondria inhibitor? You think that's going to increased longevity when you know mitochondrial failure is thought to be the most common cause of premature aging i don't think so okay f minus in your tap water that's also an inhibitor of electron transport great okay atrazine what they spray on all the the non-organic corn complex three inhibitor decide despite being super estrogenic bpa the typical classic that's almost like glass bottle okay that's a mitochondrial inhibitor too and that, what i'm trying to point out here too is and by the way Almost anything that's inhibiting mitochondria is toxic to your brain because your brain needs to make tons of energy fast. So a lot of these estrogenic chemicals, they're not just estrogenic. Estrogenic chemicals tend to make people fat because they're fat storage hormones. They're also neurotoxic. They make you stupid, okay? Does anybody think the American population is largely fat and stupid? If you've been studying them, you would come to that conclusion. And I wonder if it's not necessarily kind of intentional. F minus lowers his IQ as well, okay? All right, what else? Uh, glyphosate, that's sprayed on all the non-organic soy, which is a super common thing. It's like the cheap protein for uh, processed foods, for fast foods, 
Okay. Like I said, metformin inhibiting complex one, <laughs> furosemide, Lasix is a common pill. I can go on and on, but what I'm saying is there's tons of common things and excess dietary fat will in inhibit electron transport in the mitochondria. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is where like over 80% of the energy in your body is made. Okay. And all these things are messing it up. And lots of them are common. Here's another big one, antifungals. Well, guess what? Antifungals means anti-mold. There's tons of that stuff in all these processed foods because they don't want mold growing in their food or would get shipped back to them. They would lose money. So they put all these antifungals in there. Well, guess what? They're inhibiting your mitochondria. And then, then people also are simultaneously taking stimulants. I'll explain the significance of that, but they're screwing themselves. They're burning the candle at two ends. They're taking a stimulant, ra ramping up their metabolic rate of their brain cells or neurons while they're simultaneously dropping oxygen and glucose delivery from the high fat meals and the sodium. And on top of that, they're ingesting mitochondria inhibitors. You see the screw job here? You increase the metabolic rate of the neuron while you drop the oxygen and glucose delivery and you drop the mitochondrial function, the ability to produce ATP, which is needed to detoxify the cell, to pump the calcium out of the cytoplasm. The neuron's screwed, okay? It can't meet its demands. Dies by apoptosis. You lose brain cells that way. So anyways, and there's a whole bunch more. A lot of those other ones are common too. We're not going to go into all of them today. Okay, now I want you to see all these people watching out for you. Okay, so this is the... These are all the three-letter agencies that all have approved F- in the water. If you go through the papers on F- in the water, it is widely known that it is a potent brain toxin. It's widely known that it's a free radical. It's an electron stealer. It's a very powerful pathogen. It lowers IQ. Um, it, it can be toxic in so many ways. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah, it has a small benefit to teeth. Uh, a minuscule benefit to teeth that's not even that strongly confirmed. And <laughs> it's a major toxin, okay? Makes people dumb down and docile. Gee, I wonder if that's an accident. All right, um, here's another. Okay, here's thesis number eight. Why do doctors treat autoimmune disease with powerful pills similar to chemotherapy that have a, about a 0% cure rate? The patient takes it for life when you can often cure by preventing leaky gut. And avoiding all these other things we just talked about, you know, the toxins, GP, fluoride, aluminum. Okay, um, the Ivy League books don't even mention leaky gut. I went through the recent Ivy League big pathology textbook, 2,000 pages, nothing about leaky gut in the chapter on autoimmune disease, even though it's like the most common cause of autoimmune disease. Uh, medical students graduate, because I talk to medical students a lot, I ask them, so what do you think of leaky gut? They go, excuse me? I go, leaky gut. Oh, they go, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> That's after they've taken their boards and they studied pathology, okay? Backwards and forwards. It's not in their book. Okay, here's Sari Stanjic. She wrote a very nice book about what's missing from medicine. And she had MS and she like looked at the twin studies and said, gee, with identical twins, usually the other one doesn't get it. That means it's not genetic. <laughs> I thought it was funny too. She said something funny. She said, doing a residency in medicine teaches you to be unhealthy because you're sleep deprived. Okay, then you're always eating junk food and you're always stressed out and in a hurry. And you don't have time to exercise. So <laughs> you learn how to be unhealthy. All right, here's another thing. Okay, why do medical centers, most of the major medical centers, and you go to these nutrition courses for doctors, they're usually gonna talk about bariatric surgery, all these drugs, Ozempic, and all this other stuff. And then they're gonna recommend a high fat version of the Mediterranean diet. Okay, the Mediterranean diet is stupid. It almost doesn't forbid anything. And it's what a phony expert says when they wanna pretend they're being smart. Well, I would recommend the Mediterranean. Oh, would you? Okay, where'd you read that? Did you read anything? They don't even know what they're talking about. How could you say that with your straight face? Okay, they even recommend the Mediterranean diet to these CTE patients, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's a terrible diet for the brain. It's completely stupid. People sometimes ask me, why am I so confident about what I say about the brain? I go, because I studied it. I paid attention. I know what's going on, okay? Whereas I know <laughs> that most of the people who pretend to talk about the brain don't know what they're talking about, okay? It's so obviously stupid. It's not even funny. I call the Mediterranean diet the antichrist of diets because it promises salvation, but it leads them into health hell. It's totally stupid. You think you're going to improve arterial blood flow by ingesting olive oil and nuts and seeds and meat and dairy and alcohol. Stupid. Okay. Um, what are the, oh, another thing too about the, the brain here, by the way, is a patient who had head trauma to the frontal lobes. There's a focal contusion, a focal bleed in the brain. Um, and you'll have the, the tissue that's destroyed by the brain, the core of the traumatic uh, brain injury. And you'll also have the core of a cerebral infarct, a stroke. Okay, that's dead brain. But in the surrounding tissue, you have something called a penumbra. Penumbra, like in Greek, means twilight. So that is brain tissue that is injured, 
but it's still partly functional and it might fully recover. On the other hand, it's penumbra. It could go the other way and it could become destroyed and die. So what I'm saying is after a person has traumatic brain injury or they had a stroke, neurologists don't know this. I know lots of neurologists. I talk to them all the time. They're very nice and they really do the best they can for their patients, but they've never been taught about leaky gut or the issue of leaky blood brain barrier related to lack of dietary fiber. The same things that cause leaky gut tend to cause leaky blood brain barrier. The same things that cause leaky blood brain barrier tend to cause leaky gut. So people get leaky blood brain barrier after a stroke or traumatic brain injury, but they also get leaky gut, which is double dangerous because now you can get more toxic stuff through the gut at the same time when the blood brain barrier has a gap in it, you can get more toxins into the brain. So that puts the penumbra at great risk to be destroyed and lost, really expand the diameter of the destroyed tissue by the traumatic brain injury and um, or the stroke. So it's good to know that. And dietary fiber protects. This is just showing you know where contusions typically happen in the frontal lobe because that's where the head trauma occurs and the surface of the skull is kind of rough in those areas. Also the anterior temporal lobe, the anterior pole. You can look at a brain. A brain just looks like your hand. I don't know if I can get this in the webcam. You know, your thumb's like temporal lobe. This part of your hand is the frontal lobe. This vertical crease is the central sulcus of Orlando. Then right behind it is the occipital lobe. So you can see your brain right there. You can see bonk right there is where you get uh, contusions in fear or brain. And you also get a manchur temporal pole. Okay, and you want to eat your dietary fiber, maintains your um, your blood brain barrier, helps to maintain it significantly. And they need longer rest from their trauma. And another thing I'll tell you, a lot of people don't know this. I think soccer is stupid. Soccer is stupid because you have kids and you got a grown man doing a corner kick and these kids are hitting the ball at their head. It's like volunteer to be punched in the head. It's totally stupid. You know, I think soccer, the kicking the ball is great, but I think hitting the ball at your head, stupid. I've known people who had to drop out of college from brain damage from that. Okay, why does adult psychiatry prescribe drugs that hardly ever cure anybody? A lot of these drugs are like excitotoxins themselves, okay? Dr. Bragan, I think, is the greatest psychiatrist who ever lived. He said, all psychi psychiatric drugs basically cause a slowly progressive lobotomy. You hear that? That's not a misprint. The greatest psychiatrist who ever lived says, virtually all psychi psychiatric drugs basically cause a slowly progressive lobotomy, okay? Now, here's another lady, Grace Jackson, and she wrote a book called Drug-Induced Dementia, A Perfect Crime, and she basically makes the same point. These, these psychiatric drugs are much, much, much more neurotoxic than is widely recognized, okay? And that whole uh, single neurotransmitter theory is really bogus, okay? And so here'd be like a typical synapse in the brain. Let's say you're releasing serotonin, goes across the synaptic cleft to the postsynaptic neuron, binds a receptor, serotonin receptor, and then the neurotransmitter has reuptake into the presynaptic neuron. Okay, fine, beautiful. You can give a drug, an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so it blocks the reuptake. Okay, then you'll have the neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft a little longer, and theoretically, you'll get more of a effect on the postsynaptic neuron. But it's not that simple, because in the words of Bregan, the brain fights the drug, okay? So what it'll do is it'll reduce the number of postsynaptic receptors. It'll also uh, increase the number of serotonin reuptake transporters, so it's going to have all these compensatory adaptations. And sometimes these can change the brain so much, you can never get back to the way you were because brain synapses are much more complicated than that. They're more like, they're not just single synapse with one neurotransmitter. There's often almost like a symphony going on of a bunch of neurons all intercommunicating with each other. And when you throw a drug in there, you're like throwing a monkey wrench in there, okay? And it can really mess things up long-term. Okay, glutamate is kind of like the on switch. That's over 90% of neurons. And then GABA is the off switch is about 5% of neurons. And there's only about 1% each uh, in the ballpark of that. All these other ones, the more famous neurotransmitters, the norepinephrine, the serotonin, the dopamine and all that stuff. Okay, so I'm kind of joking here about psychiatry, but really basically is, this is a lot what clinical medical conventional psychiatry is like. You can take a pill and get a chemical lobotomy. Okay, you can get electroshock, an electrical lobotomy, or you can go for some type of surgical procedure and have a, a partial surgical lobotomy, okay? Or you could run for your life and start learning about what your other options are. All right, uh, why do urologists, this is thesis number 11, why do urologists operate on so many prostate cancers? Okay, Dean Ornish did a great study where he showed that it's like 98 biopsy proven prostate cancers who wanted to go under watchful waiting, declining uh, surgery, declining chemotherapy, declining radiation initially. They just ate, you know, like I think it was close to a vegan diet. It might have been vegetarian, but it was close to vegan. I forget exactly what the diet was. And um, they all kept their PSAs, prostate specific antigens, the blood test that indicates prostate cancer, the same or it went down. And they didn't need to go on to other more aggressive treatments. Whereas the ones who went, you know, uh, same diet and lifestyle as usual had a tendency to 
undergo elevation of their PSAs. Uh, they were all biopsy proven. And this is low grade prostate cancer, but that was a pretty impressive study. Okay, uh, T. Colin Campbell did his research and it showed that in general, animal protein was the most powerful carcinogen. And that's in his book, The China Study. He's got interviews, both Dr. Ornish and uh, Dr. Campbell got interviews on Chef AJ's show. You can just watch all this stuff for free. You don't need to buy the books. You could just watch the lectures for free. I mean, if you want to buy the book, you can, but you could just watch the lectures for free. It's a pretty good deal. Okay, why do nephrologists know so little about nutrition? Nephrologists, excuse me, they're kidney doctors. They're the best at dialysis. Nobody else knows that. That's their turf. Nobody can mess with it. It's kind of complicated. They're the only ones who know it. But, excuse me, I never met one that studied Kempner. Kempner was a kidney uh, expert. And uh, basically, most of what a kidney does, 75% of its work approximately, is excreting nitrogen. Nitrogen only comes from protein. So doesn't it make sense? If you reduce dietary protein, you give the kidney a vacation, give it a better chance to heal, lighten its workload. I mean, anybody could know that, but it's not well known. Here's a lady who's a dietitian, works with uh, kidney failure patients. She got a nice interview here on Chef AJ's show. Just why don't you watch it? It's easy. If you're if you're worried about the kidney, just know that. I can tell you tons and tons of old folks in the USA got mild kidney failure by the time they're in their 50s. And you think about it, if you do a kidney transplant and the donor, they give away a kidney, they still got normal kidney function at that point. So by the time somebody's showing up with, you know, these mild kidney failures, they've already lost 50% of their kidney function. Not good. Okay, here's a good book. This one's by Lee Hall called Stopping Kidney Disease Basics. He's not a doctor. He's just a patient, smart guy who had kidney failure. And then he studied everything about it. And it's a pretty good book, but it's way too long-winded. It could have been like a half the length, almost a third of the length, but it's still good. I liked it. I liked it. And I think it's a good book. Okay, um, now pediatric psychiatry is a disaster. I mean, think about it. If you were on a street corner and you tried to sell amphetamines to somebody, that would be against the law to sell amphetamines to an adult. But they give amphetamines to children, essentially amphetamines, these attention deficit drugs. It's crazy, okay? They're high risk for causing brain damage, turning these poor kids into psychiatric patients. It's like, why does psychiatry poison children? I'm sure it has nothing to do with putting profits over people, like I was saying, okay? If there was no profit in it, do you think they'd be giving amphetamines to children? And so here I'm going to allude to, this is the painting of Mark Anthony's funeral oration for Julius Caesar and the Mark Anthony speech about the death of Caesar from Julius Caesar play by Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury children, not to praise them. The noble psychiatrists have told you that amphetamines are good for children and the psychiatrists are honorable men. You all did love children once and not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for them? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin with these children, and I must pause till it come back to me. It's ridiculous. Okay, here's a good book, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. He documents all the complications of these amphetamine drugs given to children and how these children long-term have poor outcomes. Okay, and Bregan would say it causes brain damage. Okay, all right. Um, number 14, why do pediatricians give toxic drugs to children that do more harm than good? That's a big issue. We won't get into that too much, but I just showed you that Tylenol is a mitochondria inhibitor. And sometimes maybe the kid needs it, but kids get way more Tylenol than deserve. It's also a liver toxin. Okay, number 15, why do cancer doctors often give chemotherapy even when they know that it's unlikely to benefit the patient? And my impression is that there's kind of an attitude in conventional medicine. We might as well give it a try. Well, you know, I, you know, the person might only have a certain number of months left. There might be times when it's reasonable to give it a try, but there's other times when you should say, let them just live in peace the last couple of months they have rather than try something that's low yield, okay? It depends. All right, number 16. Why do so many long-term survivors of cancer say that the key was to become more a low-fat vegan, sleep more, exercise more, and be more religious, okay? <laughs> but that's never talked about, okay? All right, now a couple things here. This is a lady, um, Janet Murray Wakeland. She ran 360, there's her husband. He runs marathons too. She ran a marathon every single day for the entire year, 365 of them all around. This is what his t-shirt is showing, the periphery of Australia, all right? And he, she, excuse me, she wrote a book called Raw Cures Vegan. I just bit my tongue. Raw Cures Vegan. Okay, that's incredible, the recovery. And Ruth Heidrich, she's another marathon triathlete lady. And they have incredible recovery eating these uh, plant food diets. Okay, this lady here is uh, Kelly Turner. And she was working at one of these East Coast cancer centers and she um, 
noticed that she had one patient who was a long-term survivor of metastatic cancer. And she tried to share that with the rest of the staff over there. And nobody cared. She's like, how come you don't care about this? This is a big deal. And then she started interviewing them, you know, traveling to their houses and interviewing them and reading the case reports on them. And she's like, somebody ought to put this all together and write about it. And no one else wanted to. So she did. She wrote a good book, Radical Remissions. By the way, Ruth Heidrich, I've talked to her before. She's very nice. She um, had a real interesting story. She was riding her bike, got hit by a car, had a comminuted fracture of her leg. Um, and they told her she'd never walk again. She was back running within six months. The point, And she felt it was because she eats so many greens and 100% vegan diet that um, she just healed fast from everything and had great recovery. She gets diagnosed about 42 years of age with uh, metastatic breast cancer. She's still alive at 87. And I've often sort of seen that pattern of who survives metastatic breast cancer a long time or metastatic cancer. They're often people who exercise a lot. It activates the lymphatics, you know, get your immune system functioning better. They're often in warm climates. They get sunshine. She's in Australia. She's in Hawaii. And I've seen other ones in California and other places that seem to help. Um, they get their sunshine, they get their rest, they reduce their stress. Often they're pretty religious. It sort of depends, but they got some sense of purpose in their life that I think increases the function of the immune system and they um, do all those things. Okay. She summarized that in her book. Okay. The other thing is the pink ribbon. Everybody sees everybody run around the pink ribbon when somebody has got breast cancer and yes, they mean well, their heart's in the right place. That's wonderful. But they're just giving money to the chemo company. I don't see them ever empowering these women by teaching them about, you know, estrogen. It's pretty simple. Oh, this is just saying Oppo doesn't really know about diabetic physiology either. And here's the stupid kind of stuff I see. Here's like a commercial telling a woman she should wear deodorant at night. That's ridiculous. Totally stupid. You're going to increase the amount of exposure of your breast to this stuff. Okay, here's another lady putting deodorant on. Notice she shaved her armpits. Okay, what am I talking about? You know, upper outer quadrant breast cancer used to be about 30% of breast cancer. Now it's about 60% of breast cancer. Your armpit has shared lymphatics, the axilla it's called, with your upper outer quadrant. So deodorant typically has a lot of aluminum in it that blocks up the sweat pores. That's why it's called deodorant. But then it also has got power benzoic acid, estrogenic chemicals. Well, aluminum is a metalloestrogen. So you're sharing that through your lymphatics. And that's thought to be one of the major causes of increased risk. The lady out of it, she's a lady, a PhD lady out of United Kingdom. Her name is Philippa Darber. She wrote a whole textbook about estrogenic chemicals. She did a lot of that research showing that deodorant increases your risk. And I think it's totally stupid and conformist. When you walk in a room, you say, hey, how you doing? We don't sniff each other like a dog. We don't walk up and say, can I sniff your armpit? Okay, it's just conformist, low IQ stupidity to be wearing deodorant. All right, here's another thing. Uh, when we have high estrogen levels in our body, we excrete it by defecation the liver will conjugate it with glucuronic acid. Just think of that being like a glucose with a carboxylic attached to it. So here's E for estrogen, and here's our glucuronic acid. It's excreted into the bile, which then passes into the small bowel, the duodenum, and then it passes out of our body. We defecate it out of our body. That's how we lower our estrogen levels. But when you eat a high processed food diet, meat diet with a lack of fiber, you get bad gut bacteria. There's really only two types of bacteria you need to know about. There's good bacteria, bad bacteria. Good bacteria are fed by fiber. Bad bacteria occur in the absence of fiber, dietary fiber. All right. So they have more of an enzyme called glucuronidase, and they will cleave the conjugation. So they will separate the estrogen from the glucuronic acid. When that happens, the estrogen gets reabsorbed in the body. So it raises a person's estrogen level. Tap water also has tons of estrogen and estrogenic chemicals in it. So those increase your risk. And the reason I say this is I know lots of people say, Dr. Rogers, every woman in my family had to get a hysterectomy before age 35. Uh, and I go, why? It's always because of fibroids. Okay. So what I'm saying is it's because their estrogen levels are off the chart. They're getting tons in their water, tons in their processed food. They don't, they don't eat any fiber, hardly any fiber. So they got the bad gut bacteria and they're all using deodorant. Okay. And then they're all using laundry detergent. Okay. Here's a real quick summary of the estrogen. Here's a cholesterol. Basically estrogen is a steroid hormone, meaning it's got a cholesterol backbone, meaning there's four rings, A, B, C, D. Okay. And the money finding is that you got a hydroxyl group, OH, also called an alcohol group. And it's on this carbon right here with estrogen. It's uniquely a benzene ring, meaning there's three double bonds and they resonate amongst these six carbons. All right. So the point is this provides tremendous shelf life stability, the aromatic ring, it's called the benzene ring. And then the hydroxyl group makes it antimicrobial. So it's in everything. It's in all the personal care products. Good luck finding a personal care product without an estrogenic preservative. Okay, and that'll activate, actually, I'll go back to it. That'll activate the estrogen receptor is it'll form a hydrogen bond with this hydroxyl group. So what I'm saying is you can't escape these things other than minimize the amount of pro personal care products you use. I don't even use shampoo and poo anymore. I mean, I don't need to, I don't got much hair, but 
I have a little more hair than this. I don't got this haircut. I still don't, you don't need it. It didn't make any difference to use it or not use it. I don't use any laundry detergent on my detergent. I just rinse my, my dishes in the water. I don't put them through the dishwasher. If you don't cook with oil, you don't need a dishwasher. Get that stuff on there. Okay, um, neurologist. How come they don't put multiple sclerosis patients on the Roy Swank diet? He's got the best results of anybody. He's followed some of his patients over 50 years. At 34 years, he, he published his results and about 95% of his early diagnosed MS patients never developed a problem. They still had their ADLs, activities of daily living intact. Okay, incredible results. He did a whole bunch of research on blood flow. Um, there's his book, Roy Swank's book. He's got online YouTube videos for free. Okay, um, neurologists are not trained in these toxins. I talk to them about these things. They don't know it. Okay, these are smart people. You know, they're in the top half of their class and they don't know this stuff. Okay, um, they don't know, like I said, the plant fiber protects both the gut barrier and the blood barrier. This should, I actually made lectures and I told them this should change your management. I said, your field is out of date. I own the neurology textbook, 1700 page, one out of the Ivy League schools. It's a joke. <laughs> it, to me, it's like, a, it's like reading a comic book, okay? You guys, you know, you don't know about blood brain barrier. All you're doing is selling drugs. Stupid. Most of these conventional medicine books, internal medicine and internal medicine subspecialty books are a big joke. If you read a surgical textbook, usually they're rather logical. To take out the appendix, you have, you know, 50 steps you have to do and you will remove the appendix safely. Okay, great. All right. If you read a, you know, imaging guided surgery, the kind of field that I used to do, it's also pretty logical. These are the 20 steps you need to do to put in a porta cap. Okay. Uh, if you read the pathology literature on histology, for example, look at a slider in a microscope. These are normal cells. These are cancer cells. Okay. Radiology is also objective. Let's say you're reading a, a chest x-ray, normal size heart, abnormal size heart. Okay. That's all well and good. But then you get to internal medicine, internal medicine, medicine subspecialties. It's like big joke. It's all like I just told you. Nobody knows the cause associated with aging. Partly genetic, take our pills, slow it down a little bit. It's like every single chapter is the same thing. I'm like, this is total stupidity. Then you go into the nutritional literature. We cured diabetes. We cured obesity. We cured coronary artery disease. All right. Um, and also you read these dementia books. They talk about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is so stupid. I can't believe people aren't embarrassed to mention it, but they've been so brainwashed. Oh, Alzheimer's is the most com com common cause of dementia. Really? Do you even know what you're talking about? What is Alzheimer's? You can't diagnose it by history. You can't diagnose it by physical exam. You can't reliably di diagnose it by a blood test. You can't reliably diagnose it, in my opinion, by imaging. They'll say, well, look for parietal atrophy, medial temporal atrophy. We hardly ever see that pattern. Even the so-called nuclear medicine tests are not that reliable. And then you say, well, we can diagnose it at autopsy. No, there's a lot of controversy about the diagnosis of Alzheimer's at autopsy because many normal patients have so-called Alzheimer's findings, you know, extracellular senile plaques, intracellular neurofibrillary tangles, and vice versa. The so-called Alzheimer's patient doesn't have it. So it's bogus. And then the treatment, the treatment makes the patient sicker, all the side effects from those drugs. So what I'm saying is, does that not sound like a joke? You can't diagnose it and you can't treat it. Stupid, that's BS, all right? And then if you want a good theory, the best introductory theory of dementia is Alzheimer's Turning Point, okay, by Jack Delatory. He's the one who tied off the, the mouse arteries, the carotid, and found that a couple months later, middle age and older mice became demented. Okay, and this was a very good book here by Blaylock on excitotoxins. I take it kind of beyond that. I, I take the, you know, the Peter Rogers MD theory and neurovascular uncoupling. That's actually the best theory. We don't have time to go into detail. Oh, I forgot to mention this guy. This guy, Martin Paul, he's the best guy on EMF. If you want to learn about EMF, he's got a bunch of free lectures. He's the best guy on that subject. Okay, this is a deletory work. You tie off the carotid, the mouse becomes demented two months later, you know, middle-aged and older mouse. And then people say, well, so what? Not that many people have a stenotic or occluded carotid. Tons of people got, he called it chronic cerebral hyperperfusion, lack of blood supply to the brain. You get that with AFib. You get that with CHF. Uh, with sleep apnea, you, well, you decrease your glucose. Um, Overtreated hypertension, you get a drop in blood flow. If you undertreat hypertension, you get atherosclerosis in the brain, so you get the same effect. Okay, aortic stenosis, aortic regurge, post-cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, hypotension. They'll run your pressures real low. Like my dad had cabbage. I tried to talk him out of it, but I couldn't. I didn't know enough at the time. It was like 20 something years ago, 25 years ago. Um, they ran them like, you know, 95 over 60. I'm like, talk to the anesthesiologist. Why are you running them so low? They go, oh, we don't want them to bleed it as anastomosis, the plug insides for the grafts. All right. And my dad came out of it fine, but I think there's other people probably got more baseline disease than my dad. He was a relatively healthy doctor. Okay. Compared to a lot of the patients are train wrecks. So a lot of, you know, significant risk of brain damage, I think, after that. Okay, here's the internal carotid artery coming up in the brain. There's an anterior cerebral artery, which I'm not drawing on here because it'd be too complicated, but here's the middle cerebral artery. Here's the lenticular strides going into the basal ganglia. The three levels of the brain looking at a coronal section here would be the basal ganglia here. These are the deep gray nuclei, so to speak, where the cell bodies are. 
corona radiata at the level of the frontal horns, and then above that is a centrum semiovale. Okay. And the point I'm saying is you tend to stroke at this level from hypertension, you shear off and injure the lenticular strides. These are the lacunar infarcts, often hemorrhagic, really common. I see them every day. Okay, then here's the most common spot. I put a skull and crossbones because this is where you have hypoperfusion because there's very poor collateral circulation to the deep white matter of the brain, both at the corona radiata level and the central semiovale level. And so you see how you're double screwed here. If, you're, if you over-treat hypertension and you drop their pressure too low, they'll stroke this area. Okay, I'll see, sometimes see a patient with 100 little microstrokes. Now, often they're initially silent, but they add up to decreased cognitive function and decreased motor function. And these old people are real slow and cognitively slow and physically slow. Um, if you don't treat their hypertension, you run the risk of injuring these arteries down here to lenticular strides. Plus, you'll just get more intracranial atherosclerosis. And over time, you'll drop perfusion of the spot. The number one risk factor for all these small strokes, initially silent, they call them association cortex, is hypertension. Okay. Diabetes is real common too. AFib tends to make a big clot. You toss it up and have a big stroke. Okay. Those are the three most common causes of cerebral infarct. Okay. And then here's just my neurovascular theory of uncoupling. Basically MR is metabolic rate. GOD is, I'm kind of joking there. I could have called it OGD, but I called it GOD like, my God, glucose oxygen delivery. So basically you got a metabolic rate and you have a glucose oxygen delivery. They should be matched. But if you take a stimulant, caffeine, sleep dep deprivation does the same thing. Psychological stress, you get more glutamate transmission going across, exciting the postsynaptic neuron, um, corticosteroids, tobacco, amphetamines. Okay, all of those things are ramping up that metabolic rate. You need to couple it, okay? And a younger person is better at doing this. You're 20 years old, you can go out and get drunk, come home at two o'clock in the morning, get up you know, at 5 a.m. and go to work and be fine. You can't do that when you get older. Okay, so what I'm saying is those stimulants are ramping up metabolic rate. Same thing with aspartame too, okay? And GP is also an excitotoxin glyphosate on the non-organic soy and whatnot. All right. And so then you drop the glucose and oxygen delivery due to high fat meal, sticking the red blood cells together, sodium vasoconstrictor. Okay, fine. Uh, antihypertensive medications, fine. AFib, you're losing the atrial kick. All that stuff's widening the gap between metabolic rate and glucose and oxygen delivery. And then the kicker is you throw some poison in there with these inhibitors of mitochondria, what I just talked about, inhibitors of circa, sarcoplasmic, endoplasmic, reticulum, calcium, ATPase. You see how the neuron is screwed? It can't make enough ATP to pump the calcium out. I went, I had much more detail in my lecture with Chef AJ on dementia and dementia prevention, but basically you're widening the gap between the metabolic rate of the neuron and its ability to compensate, produce energy. And that's going to lead to a, a excess of calcium in the cytoplasm and overwhelm that neuron. And many of them die and go into apoptosis. So this is called neurovascular uncoupling. Neurovascular coupling means that the neuron's metabolic rate is matched to the vascular delivery of glucose and oxygen. And also it's making the assumption you have intact mitochondrial function. And the more this gap occurs, neurons just start dying. They go into a program cell death called apoptosis where they recycle themselves. That's why you can't see it on a CT or MRI. All you see is the brain just keeps shrinking from atrophy. And that's what I see all the time. I've seen many thousands and thousands and thousands of brains. Most common thing I see is atrophy. And this really explains everything. And there's other people who've done research on this. I call it an expansion of the calcium hypothesis, but I've put it all together. I'm the one who put it all together. You know, the nutrition, the toxicology, everything. All right. Um, Infectious disease doctors, they don't know anything about postprandial bacterial endotoxemia. I, I know infectious disease doctors and I like them. They're real nice. But I ask them real simple questions. What do you think about um, dormant bacteria? And they look at me like they don't know, but they look at me like that's a stupid question. We're the experts on infectious disease. How presumptuous of you to ask us a question about dormant bacteria? And they look at me like there's no such thing. And then I'll say to them, well, what about, you know, TB? Everybody knows TB goes dormant. They're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, what about syphilis? They all know that. What about Lyme disease? You know, that has a dormant phase. Okay. Well, then what about these other ones? What about intracellular back bacteria? We know about those. Uh, so it becomes pretty obvious. What about the literature on blood transfusion? And then they start going, oh, well, you might be right. Oh, they don't know it. It's just not in their textbook. So they don't know it and they don't read on their own. All right. And they don't know about the effect of iron overload on reactivation. So if you want to learn about dormant bacteria, uh, this is Dr. Pretorius and this is Dr. Cal, their PhD researcher. She's from South Africa. He's from England. They're both geniuses. They should win Nobel Prizes. They've done great work. And they also did a lot of work on the effect of when a person has an infection, bacterial or viral, and the secondary effects of iron, iron overload, which most Americans are. Most men are after 25. Most women are when they're postmenopausal. It has a synergistic effect to increase these problems and make the blood more prothrombotic. And that's predisposing people to cognitive impairment. 
and to myocardial infarction and decreased cardiac function. This is a very common problem. And I can assure you, nobody knows about it. Okay. I got friends who are like the smartest internal medicine doctors. They don't know this stuff. And I kind of tease them a little bit about it. Okay. And they come to me, they're like, oh, you're right, man. We got to learn about that stuff. I'm like, oh, watch my lecture. Okay. All right. And here, here's an example of this postprandial uh, hyperthrombotic situation that's occurring. You start out with fibrinogen. The secondary protein structure is what's called alpha helix, like a cylinder, like a slinky. And then when it's exposed to LPS, gram-negative bacteria endotoxin that's gotten into the blood because of leaky gut or the gram-positive endotoxin, LTA, lipotychoic acid, it causes the fibrinogen to change from an alpha helix to a beta-pleated sheet and becoming flat. Now they can stack up on each other and they form what, you know, Kellen Pretorius called dense matted deposits. And these are clots that are very refractory to lysis, meaning they're hard to dissolve. So they're more likely to progress and damage your tissue. Plug up little arteries in your brain, plug up little arteries in your heart, okay? Trust me, post-viral infection, this is a big deal, okay? If you study it, you'll be glad you looked this up if you're trying to understand those types of problems. Leaky gut, super common. Here's all, the, I made this slide. All these causes of leaky gut, one, two, three, four, I don't know how many, 25 of them or something. So if you have autoimmune disease, what I would do is the first thing I do is try to fix all these problems, okay? And if I couldn't fix all these problems, then I would consider going on all those, you know, omega-3 protocols and all that stuff. And if that didn't work, then I would consider taking those powerful autoimmune drugs like the rheumatologists give. But man, those things are powerful. They're like chemotherapy. I wouldn't do that unless I tried all this stuff first. That's what I personally would do if it was me. Basically, when you eat dietary fiber, the good gut bacteria produce short-chain fatty acids, which are used by the enterocytes. The gut's called the enteric tract to make tight junctions to prevent bad things from getting through your gut lining. When you don't have tight junctions, you get LPS, lipopolysaccharide, gram-negative bacterial endotoxin coming in, causing all kinds of damage and other problems. You absorb big chunks of protein. The immune system forms antibodies to those. Because they're similar enough to our body's own proteins, you can then have those antibodies cross-react with their own tissue. So... Normally, you can only absorb like a tripeptide. That means three amino acids together, one, two, or three. So isolated amino acid, a single peptide, dipeptide, tripeptide. But you get big chunks of protein with leaky gut, and you can form these autoantibodies. Uh, these, these antibodies, due to molecular mimicry, they can cross-react and cause autoimmune disease. Okay, how come orthopedic doctors know so little about low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet? And here's a nice essay by Dr. Madugal called Diet is the Only Hope for Arthritis, okay? Um, here's uh, the whole story of calcium supplements for preventing osteoporosis, another stupid thing. Here's a paper showing that women who took over 1,400 milligrams of uh, calcium supplement per day, <laughs> their all-cause mortality was increased 2.6 times over, okay? I think that's kind of funny. Then you look at the Bantu women in South Africa, they would typically have like nine kids, breastfeed them all for like three or four years, get hardly any dietary calcium, like like the, about the amount of one cup of milk a day, all right? And they don't have any problem with osteoporosis. So that's what I'm trying to say. This idea that you just take one thing, calcium, and that fixes all your problem. But bone's a lot more complicated than a little calcium. You need to exercise, okay? So anyways, I thought that was kind of funny. All right, here's back pain. And this is the ischemic theory of spinal degeneration. There were some papers in the past, even as old long ago as like the 1980s or 1990s, showing that ischemia can cause disc failure. So ischemia is lack of blood flow. I'm the one who figured out though, it's not just a, you know occasional degenerated disc in your spine. It's actually the whole entire process of spinal degeneration, including disc, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis and OPLL. I'll show you a picture of it. So basically what happens, you have a disc, the disc is alive, it runs on anaerobic glycolysis, it gets a lumbar artery, supplies a small blood vessel to the end plate, upper end plate, lower end plate. And then by diffusion, the glucose gets into the neuron, I'm sorry, gets into the disc and the disc extrudes its waste products. However, when you get atherosclerosis, typically it's on the posterior wall of the abdominal aorta, stenosis or occludes the lumbars, then you're dropping the blood supply to the end plate. So you drop it to the disc, Outer part of the disc is like a steel belted radial tire. And when it cracks due to ischemia, then the nucleus pulposus, the center of a disc, it's like a jelly donut. That jelly donut material will leak into the annulus fibrosis level and even protrude further back, kind of like toothpaste. And you get a disc herniation. A little crack in the back is called an annular fissure. We used to call them annular tear. But that's a gen generated disc. As it dries out, it'll then lose height. And it loses height, it loses the ability to evenly distribute the weight of motion in the spine. Spine has proprioceptors, so it senses the abnormal motion 
two vertebral bodies and the intervening disc is called a spinal segment. So you get spinal segment instability and the spine compensates by laying down bone. I'll show you in the next slide. So it lays down bone from the VB below, the VB above. You get these bridging osteophytes that then connect and fuse, so they lock. And that's diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. We call it dish of these fused osteospites to fix to fix itself. And it's like the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, the hedgehog is only one trick, but it's the best trick. And it would be to play dead. But what I'm saying, what the spine does is it just starts laying down calcium to form bone and fuse everything. It'll fuse the disc. That's called interbody fusion. It'll fuse across the posterior disc space, and then it'll fuse the posterior longitudinal ligament. So that's called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And as soon as you fuse one level, now you have to bear more weight at the adjacent level. So that fails. That's called accelerated adjacent segment failure. All right, degeneration. And that continues all the way from the sacrum and the pelvis all the way up to the skull. I see this every day. And I'll tell you how stupid the textbooks were. Back in the 1990s, the textbooks I trained on, they all said, OPLL is a rare condition, more common than Asian persons. BS, I see it all day long in Americans, okay? And I see inner body fusion. I even see something called OLF, but OLF is not as common, ossification of longitudinal ligamentum flavum, all right? I see this stuff nonstop all day long, every single day. It's super common. There was even studies in Europe where they dug up some graveyards for construction reasons, reasons and where the aristocrats were buried, they had lots of OL, they had lots of this stuff, dish and all this uh the spinal degenerative disease and then where the peasants were dug up you know they're eating plant diets and turnips they had hardly any of this dish stuff oops i did the wrong thing there presenting okay estrogenic chemicals that's a big subject but basically estrogenic chemicals are a big part of why people are so fat and they can't lose the weight because these estrogenic chemicals are fat storage hormone have a fat storage hormone effect that says, you know, store some weight, keep the weight on, the baby might need it. The best book written on estrogenics is by Anthony J. He's a PhD lipid biochemist. He's kind of a young guy, so he doesn't know as much about nutrition, but he's great on chemicals. This is like one of the best medical books ever written. If you're interested in estrogen chemistry, um, Philippe Darbo wrote a textbook, Estrogen Chemistry as well, but this is the best one. There's a whole bunch of other ones. I've read a bunch of books on the subject. This one is entertaining, funny, and it's concise. Um, He's got videos that is, he's got a YouTube channel just by his name. I think it's called Dr. Anthony J, something like that. Okay, heroin. Why are opioids pushed so hard? I used to run a spinal injection clinic back in a previous life of mine. And, um, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, give these patients opioids. I never prescribed opioids. But um, I can tell you, opioids were pushed very hard by these drug companies. Tons of people are dying from this and sick from this. And there's, of course, opioid addiction and drug sales outside of anything conventional medicine has anything to do with but I'm telling you, I know a couple of people personally, doctors uh, and other healthcare workers who have lost family members due to this opioid stuff. It's a very common cause of death. I would never take opioids. Um, number 24, how come nutrition, epidemiology, toxicology are not taught in medical schools, even fellowships? I wonder, somebody hiding the truth from these healthcare providers, big food, big fat, big protein, big pharma, big poop control population. Okay, um, how come there's no medical specialty for nutrition? Number 25, thesis number 12. There should be, you know, everybody should be reading the like Burkitt's autobiography, okay? Well, his biography, this lady, uh, Ethel Nelson, a physician, she wrote about it. Burkitt did a lot of great stuff. He figured out abdominal pressure syndrome and that's figuring out basically the most important stuff about the abdomen, okay? And then the med typical medical students, they're, they're convinced that they know everything useful to know. But like I said, I'll let medical students follow me around. I'll tell them within two hours, I will teach you more than you have learned in the last eight years or residents. I tell them the same thing. And they always laugh. They want to be polite. But by the end of the day, they say things like, I want a refund from my med school. They know I'm right. Okay. Typical dietitians too. Dietitians, most of the ones I met don't know that much about food. And I think the reason is the big food companies buy the professorships at their schools and they teach them all kinds of stupid stuff like that. The Mediterranean diet is good. And I fructose those corn syrups. Okay. And MSG is okay. And Soy is good for you and all this other nonsense. Okay, so what I'm saying is this whole idea of seeing things in a different way, which I went through this experience in my 30s when I had to read on my own to deal with my own obesity at that time and uh, my father's coronary artery disease. It's like Alice in Wonderland where she goes through the mirror, through the looking glass and sees things in a new way. And what you'll come to realize when you study the scientific, scientific so-called foundation of internal medicine, which is basically what medical students are taught in medical school, it's a house of card. It falls apart. And it reminds me of, you know, Alice, when she talks to the caterpillar and he's just blowing smoke, okay? <laughs> when you look at it closely, it's so stupid. It's not even funny. Like pre-med education, calculus, 
physics, physical chemistry, a year of organic chemistry. You know, what you need to know about organic chemistry, you can learn that in about, you know, two weeks, the functional groups and stuff. What they mostly learn is how to synthesize paint, okay? You know, two semesters of synthesizing paint, not going to help you too much. All that stuff's a waste of time. I'm a triple boarded high tech doctor. I never use any mathematics I didn't know by fourth grade, okay? And I actually think in high school too, all this math is a joke. It's a waste of time. Nobody uses it. It's a distraction. They should be learning how to start a business and all these other useful things like they used to do auto shop. <laughs> okay, so anyways, med school, like I said, they they wear the students down and exhaust them memorizing all this minutia. I had a medical student come to me for tutoring. This is a couple of years ago, not that long ago. And he's like, his first day of anatomy class, he had to memorize all the small muscles in the back. I'm like, what a joke. I run a spinal injection clinic, okay? And I do all these complex spine biopsies, core biopsies, you know, through the pedicle and stuff. I didn't know the name of all these little muscles, okay? It's ridiculous. Um, they never, almost never learn the causes of diseases. Nothing about nutrition. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's like a, a fake education. Um, and then what happens is like the Red Queen, you know, yanking on uh, Alice's hand, they're pushed, productivity, 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 generate more billing codes, generate more billing codes. Of course, our care is good. We all follow the standard of care. But again, the standard of care is dumbed down pills only typically for, you know, cognitively slow people. And sometimes it's the same thing as optimal care, but a lot of motivated people, they can receive something better than that, that I would call optimal care, which often requires that they educate themselves. And then other doctors, if they don't play ball with big pharma and conventional medicine and insurance company, the queen says off with their heads, basically, they better play ball, at least while they're working in conventional medicine, or they will not get paid and even worse, okay? I've seen a lot of PhD researchers, they piss off big food, they get fired. The big food's got a lot of money. They'll go to the school, say, fire this guy. I have a friend who's a molecular biologist, and he has another friend who did research on high fructose corn syrup. And when he showed that it was often contaminated with mercury, they went to the university and insisted the guy be fired, and he was fired. The other guy, Tyrone Hayes, who figured out that atrazine was super estrogenic, they try to take his funding away, et cetera. Um, that's a common thing. And so I even joke the AMA should be renamed the AMMA, American Murder for Money Association. Okay, it's bad. And it's because it's too corrupted by money. Okay, and, and you know, it's getting to the point where more people are hurt than helped. Um, and I say that you cannot fix this. You cannot fix this with technology. You cannot fix this any other way than to say that mankind is created in the image of God and therefore we value him. We will do what is right for this person, no matter if we lose money, okay? And until it goes that way, it won't fix things, okay? Oh, Ayn Rand wrote the greatest book ever about art called The Romantic Manifesto. And man, she gets to the point. She talks about how great the 1800s were for art. If you study art, they were magnificent, okay? And you have to value the smallest minority is the individual. You have to value the individual. If you don't do that, and the modern society, in my opinion, does not do that, they basically say he's just a talking monkey with no soul. There's nothing special about him. We're going to go by our standard, our standard. They abuse the individual. All right. Um, okay. These are just some books all kind of saying the same thing of the decline in standards. And I'm just going to show you, I'll make a quick point because a lot of people tell me, oh, you should never mention religion when you're talking about science. They're two totally different things. No, they're not. They're completely connected. And I will show you why right here in a couple of quick examples. So here, for example, is a Pieta, magnificent sculpture, the best one ever. Okay, here's an illustration from, you know, the movie uh, Les Miserables, the book by Victor Hugo, magnificent book of forgiveness, okay? Valuing the human. He valued the human and the human did well. When you go into this atheistic Darwinism and stuff, it destroys things. It destroys art. For example, here's a uh, modern museum, statues of turds. Now that's an insult to humanity. That's degrading. They use these things, I think, to launder money too by selling them. A statue of a turd. That's what you get when you degrade mankind with this stuff. When you have love of God, love of mankind that leads you to saving people, to want to help them, okay? Okay, and you look, for example, at the French Rev, you know, back in the 1790s, it was more than a rejection of the king. It was a rejection of God, and it was a pushing atheism, and it leads to this type of stuff, you know? This is what you get when you when you, when man turns his back on God. And I'm telling you, you can't fix medicine until you fix this. I grew up around doctors. Hey, is my video working or not? Um, I grew up around doctors. I know what happens. All right. I don't know if you saw those slides. I showed you this slide and I showed you this slide. Okay. Statues of turds. That's what happens in modern art once you reject God. Okay. And then other thing too is, here's a quote by this artist. Oops. Um, this is, I didn't mean to click on that. This is uh, Thomas Wolfe, the writer. And he said, modern office buildings, they look like animal cages. 
and they always have a statue of a turd in front. I mean, this is a joke. Okay, let me select here. I'll get out. I want to get out of this. Uh, all right. I hope I'm. I hope I'm back. Let me close it. That's what I want to do. All right. So this is what you get. Versus if you build something with love and care, you get the beautiful buildings like this. People think this is a joke, but this is why society is declining. This is why healthcare is declining. And then people say, "Oh, I just care about the science. I just want to know the science." What you don't understand is unless you have good ethics, science becomes a joke. These big food companies, big pharma companies, they just buy all the scientists. Okay, I got to stop touching that thing. It keeps doing goofy things. They buy all the scientists and, they, and the scientists are poor. Okay, they don't have much money. So they have to go with big food, big pharma and do whatever they're told. So if big food or big pharma comes to a scientist, they have to make the food look good or they'll never get any money. They might even get fired from their job. So when I hear science, usually the word science actually in real life means advertising. You pick up a medical journal, it's basically an advertisement for drugs. You pick up a nutritional journal, it's usually, you know, single food studies that's an advertisement for these foods. Industry funded stuff is basically advertising because the scientists have to say what they want. Here's one summary of scientists, one in a psychology journal, and over 65% could not be replicated. Here's another one in a, what is this, cancer journals. Um or drug discovery products related to cancer biology, 75%, they could not replicate the studies. Okay, they're bogus. Um, so that's why you also have to be smart when you read these things and don't just believe everything you read because they often have secondary agendas to try to promote their drug. Uh, okay, so that's what'll happen. And that's why if you look at earlier papers, they're often a little more simple. They don't got all the fancy equipment, but they're trying to figure out the answer and they tell you the truth. Once you've had all this corruption by industry funded stuff, you have to be very careful what you read, okay? In 2023, over 10,000 scientific and medical research papers were retracted. That's a lot. That's the new record. You go back to the year 2000, it was about 100 papers rejected, okay? So that is a massive increase in the amount of bogus studies being published in the journals, okay? It's unbelievable. That's why the journals have become a joke. And the reason is they don't have ethics. And the reason why they don't have ethics is because money's more important than the people, OK, if you if you give people a drug that, you know, doesn't work, that's poisoning them. OK. And so what I'm saying is. When you lack the ethics, that's what happens. I mean, would anybody poison a child? You would say I wouldn't do it, even if the kid was a, a brat, you didn't like the parents, you didn't like anything about them. OK, you wouldn't do it. Anybody with a small amount of ethics and a God based worldview would say, no, of course, I wouldn't do that. I can tell you conventional medicine does it all day long, every day. OK, and they go, well, it's a standard of care. Yeah, look at it a little closely. It's BS, okay? Here's Harvard, so-called America's greatest university. 37 papers. Uh, you know, there's six I know were fully retracted. There's 37 that are thought to be scientific fraud because the, you win the lottery when you have a successful drug. So everybody wants to win the lottery. And the fact that all these patients will suffer, no one cares, okay? Because the money is more important than the person. That's why I'm saying you have to value the person. And until you value the person, you'll never have anything good in your science because the money's more important and the money always is going to be on sell a drug, sell a surgery and who cares about, you know, the, the patient, they don't matter. They're just talking monkeys. If you have an atheistic view. Okay. Here's the Harvard professor who studies dishonesty accused of falsifying the data. It's almost comical. And there's more, there's tons more. This is Harvard, our best university, supposedly the best university in the world founded initially as a religious divinity school to train pastors. And now it claims to be a science center and it's constantly lying and doing bogus things. And I can tell you, I've, I've read tons of textbooks coming out of Harvard. They stink. Okay. They're a joke. They're an embarrassment. It's a disgrace. Okay. And Fyodor Dostoevsky said this back in the 1800s. If there is no God, then everything is permitted, even cannibalism. I want, I want you to take that seriously because a lot of people think, oh, atheism is a morally defensible, logical position. And I'm going to tell you, if there is no God, everything is permitted. It's the system that you use if you want eugenics, okay? Um, even cannibalism, and you're going to see. So either there's going to be an improvement in ethics or things are just going to keep getting worse. I can assure you that no amount of money can change that unless you change the ethics. And here's a typical way that profit is favored. Imagine a patient has coronary artery disease. You put them on drugs, you get money from them every day. You pop a stent in, 30,000 bucks, okay? You do open heart surgery, 120 to 150,000 bucks, OK, if you teach them about the vegan diet, you either get nothing or if you bring them in for a weekend course, maybe one thousand, maybe two thousand dollars. Not much. Imagine you ran a hospital. You would almost go broke doing this unless you were set up to do it. 
Okay. And that's what I'm saying. The treatment that provides a near 100% cure rate, 99% cure rate, you don't get paid for. And then you do treatment with a 0% increase in longevity. You get $120,000, $150,000. So you have to value that patient and say, I love you. I will do what is right for you. Bragan, the great psychiatrist, the greatest one who ever lived, he said, the most important thing is to love the patient you care about. And you say, I'm going to do the right thing for this person no matter what. Okay. That gets good results. And that does the right thing for the person. Okay. And if you don't have that, you just go for the money. The patient's always going to get screwed. All right. The Pope sent a, a letter to Martin Luther, the papal bulletin, call it a papal bull, ordering him to recant. Luther refer, refused and he burnt the papal bull. There's a lot of paintings of this. Okay. Burning the papal bulletin. Another one, burning the papal bulletin. Well, I thought it was about time for somebody to do something significant in medicine to make a statement. So I've taken the PDR, physician desk reference, and the DSM, Diagnosis Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, and I've thrown them into the fire, burning the papal bull. So vegan monk burns this PDR. Here they are, the PDR and the DSM, burning in the fire. And it's a little bit like a Copernican inversion, okay? Copernicus realizes, and beautiful painting by Jan Mateko, he realized that the earth revolves around the sun. It's not the sun revolving around the earth. And what I'm saying is the best health doesn't come from drugs and surgery. Don't get me wrong. Drugs and surgery can be very useful in some settings, but much stuff should be centered on this nutrition, diet, epidemiology, toxicology, get your sleep, get your sunshine, your social factors, sense of purpose, love, religion, all this other stuff. Okay. Um, you can call it God's way of healing. You're not going to, ever cure chronic disease with Matsyilda to pill and send a bill. And I laugh. I say any health coach that wants to help patients can learn more in a week, in a month, easy than a doctor learns in 12 years ever. <laughs> it's true. So, okay, here's how the healthcare system works. The people sort of the least educated, uh, they actually love the patients and are super nice to them. The clerks, the secretaries, they love the patients. Often their patients themselves, their families are, the greeters, the transporters. They'll do anything for those patients, okay? And everybody in healthcare should be like them, all right? The thin intelligence silos are all these more educated healthcare workers, but they know their own little narrow area pretty well, but it's super rare to find somebody like a McDougal who can see the whole picture, like me, that kind of, and like other experts in health that have, that have a wide perspective and can kind of see the big picture. Most of them just know what they need to know for their job, like, you know, I call it thin intelligence. And that was a word I got from Michael Crichton, the great writer. They'll know this is how you match the yield of the pill to send the bill. Don't get me wrong. A lot of them know a lot of stuff and do a lot of good things to the patient. So I don't want to just oversimplify it. And I can also tell you, they like the patients. You know, they wouldn't have gone. All the doctors I knew, the vast majority of med students, they all went into, they wanted to help people. There's a few that went into it just for the money, but they're not, they're, they're a small percentage. Uh, but afterwards, you get so pushed down the road, you got all these loans to pay off. You get paid for standard of care. You got to go with it. You got to play ball with big pharma or you're out of medicine, okay? Hospital owners, they tend to be much more business orientated. And because they've usually got somebody above them that's cracking the whip saying, hey, we need to increase productivity. Where's the money? Where's the money? How many billing codes you generate? How many billing codes you generation? Your group is lazy. You're not generating enough billing codes. We want more billing codes. We want more money. Of course, it's good care. We all practice the standard of care. And that's how it runs at the hospital ownership level. And then you go to big pharma, it's even worse. They often know that their drug is toxic and poisonous, and they don't even publish those studies. They just publish the ones that make it look good, so they get their money. They don't care about the patients, a bunch of talking monkey useless eaters as far as they're concerned, wasting the world's resources. They want their money, okay? So if if they had ethics of God, man is creating the image of God, and we must do what is right for them, they would lose a lot of money. So they're never going to go down that path. And so what I'm saying is the more people who value that patient in the system, the better that patient will do. And in the meantime, the smart patient is going to educate themselves as much as possible to get the best possible outcomes because this system can't fix itself. Imagine you're an internist and you're like, well, I really want to use a plant-based approach and talk to my patients and empower them and educate them. You know what's going to happen? There's going to be a bean counter running that clinic saying, how come my other docs are seeing 30 patients a day? You're only seeing 15 or 20. You're going too slow. You're lazy. You're not pulling your weight. Look, you better start seeing 30 patients a day or we're going to have to let you go. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it works. Okay. And so they, they have to do that. And they're going to be staying real late every day. And on top of it, if the patient, if they just do their nutrition advice stuff and they don't prescribe the standard drug, 
Somebody can say they didn't follow the standard of care. The patient has a bad outcome. They go like, you didn't follow the standard of care. You're liable. You lose the case. So insurance companies in on it too because they don't reimburse the doc for teaching the patient. So the doc has to play ball with the system, which is designed to make them sell more drugs. Okay, it's a drug dealing system. You work at, let's say, an Ivy League school and you, you can't get promoted unless you publish more papers. Well, you can't publish more papers unless you get more drug money. And the drug money says you got to make our drug look good or we don't give you no money. So the, the Ivy League researcher has to make the drugs look good or they don't get any money or make the, the big food item, olive oil or whatever the latest nonsense is, make that look good or they don't get money. You have to play ball with the big money or, or you're out. Okay, here's Diogenes walking through Athens with a lantern, searching for one honest man in Athens. And it reminds me of a couple of jokes that I would tell. Here's the first one. What's the difference between a lawyer and a doctor? A lawyer will rob you. A doctor will rob you and kill you. Great. Voltaire said, I want my doctor to believe in God so that he does not rob me. Okay. Voltaire goes on. He's got a lot of other things to say. Voltaire says, it's dangerous to be right when the established are wrong. To announce truth is an infallible method of being persecuted. I'm very fond of truth, but I'm not at all fond of martyrdom. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. So for a doctor, if you got a lot of doctors, they're real conformists. It's very hierarchical medical training. You basically salute the senior uh, person in the hierarchy and you do as you're told or you're out. Okay. Okay, Voltaire did say some good things. The right to free speech is more important than the content of the speech. Liberty of thought is the life of the soul. Doctors should be allowed to disagree with the standard of care if they don't think it's right. But in real life, not much. Okay, this is a picture of St. Francis where he had a vision that he should try to rebuild the church. And the Pope had a vision that a monk would help rebuild the church. And he was in particular focused on San Damiano, where he, he prayed there and there was a broken down wall and whatnot. Here's San Damiano, Damiano Church. And St. Francis took it upon himself. He walked around town begging for people to give him stones. And he rebuilt San Damiano Church, the physical church. Okay, but he also inspired a lot of people. And if you will, built the mental and spiritual church in their mind to do the right thing. And what I'm saying is America, healthcare in general, must develop a spiritual mindset of we will do the right thing. And I like the song, I will serve the Lord. I will do the right thing, even if there's no money in it. St. Augustine had said, right is right, even if no one's doing it. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone's doing it. And until we adopt that mentality, healthcare will not get better, okay? And now you say, well, how can we make things better? And one thing you could do is, if you remember what Burke had said, he said, basically, if people eat a lot of fiber, they'll have big bowel movements, and you'll, you only need small hospitals, they'll be very healthy. If they don't eat a lot of fiber, they're all going to be sick. You're going to need a big hospital. Okay, so here's my joke again. The animal cages with the statue of a turd in front. And what I'm getting at is these universities are going broke, a lot of them, because more and more education is going online. So a lot of them are going to fold. Also, they don't have meritocracy in their choice of teachers. So anyways, what am I saying? Just like Walter Kempner, we already know that works. We've kind of seen the model in True North having great results. We could do something, take over some of these universities as they go bankrupt and make them into uh, educational places for people learning nutrition and health. Now, I don't have any business skill, but if somebody has business skill and they take over a university, you know, you can have the patients come in for lectures, have a buffet where they go over food selection and, you know, give them lectures on all the other healthcare stuff. That would be great. That would be great use of the land. They could go for walks around there, just like Kempner's uh, nutrition places in Durham, North Carolina. They would walk around the town um, and all the fat people would come there like a fat camp and they would go to the, the, the beach. They call it the whale watch or some other funny names. But anyways, I think that's something that could work. Turn college campuses into fat camps. I would love to work at one of those places. All right, I'm getting a little bored of conventional medicine, but it pays the bills. So I stick with it. I got a kid in grad school, a kid in college. All right, Spartan vegan stuff. We've talked about that. You know, basically the only three foods you need to know about starches, fruits, and veggies. Simple, but that's enough. Take a vitamin B12, like a methylcobalamin, and get all the social stuff straight. You'll be pretty healthy. Oh, I've, you know, somebody like one of my viewers saw this, uh, me, you know, with the Martin Luther haircut dressed like a monk, and they thought it was funny. So they sent me this. I thought this was nice of them. They sent me an email of the wise monk diet. I'm going to call it, you know, maybe the medical monk. You know, my other nickname is the Spartan vegan because I used to be a wrestler and it's cheap, Spartan, and simple, bad boy veganism. So anyway, I thought that was nice. I thought it was funny. All right. Can atherosclerosis be reversed? Yes, it can partially. 
you can reabsorb the clot itself. Uh, you can reabsorb the lipid core of the, you know, plasma membrane, fossil lipids and stuff that are in macrophages. You can reabsorb the necrotic core of dead material. Uh, some of the highly cellular fibrotic tissue, you can maybe partially reabsorb. The non the non-cellular fibrotic tissue, you're not going to reabsorb. And I've never seen calcification reabsorbed. In William Roberts' uh, paper, he said you've never seen it reabsorbed. Some people are now saying that if you stay low-fat vegan many, many years, you'll start to reabsorb some of your calcification. Maybe, but I wouldn't count on it. That's not going to save your life in the short term. In the short room, term, you can reabsorb a lot of it. You get a little less stenosis from that. But also the, the endothelial cells, the lining cells of the arteries, they come back to life when you, you, you take the high fat out of the diet and you take the sodium out of the diet. Sodium inhibits endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Also uric acid inhibits uh, endothelial uh, nitric acid, nitric oxide. So the point is you'll start making more vasodilator and you'll open up the artery just from the vasodilator effect. And that can occur very quickly in a couple of days. Excuse me, whereas more of this resorption stuff takes more and more time. So yes, you can get improvement in arterial flow you know, an initial quick effect and then a more delayed effect. And that can be really beneficial. We know the famous story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And I would say in the modern context, the Johnson can come back to life. And I want to end this talk with a prayer. I call it the impotence prayer. Our father who art in boner land, solid wood be thy name. Give us this day our daily boner and forgive us our dietary sins as we forgive those who misdiet against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from impotence. Amen. Thank you. That's it. Dr. Rogers, we need to rename the show. <laughs> let me, let me, let me have you stop sharing. We yeah. need to rename the show to Dr. Rogers Medical School. Sure. <laughs> you know, that was so funny what you said. You want to take college campuses and turn them into college fat camps. It'd be great. <laughs> I wish someone would do it. I, I have no social skills, no marketing, no business schools, but I would love to work at a place like that if someone else did it. So I learned a new word today and I love it. Fecaliths. Yep. The, they got the dry, they got dry stool on the right side of the colon and it's just one problem after another. Oh. Hey, would you mind answering a few questions that were submitted in advance just for you? Sure. Thank you. Hey, you'd make a great monk. We'll call you Brother Rogers. Huh? <laughs> okay, so the first one is for William. And he said, Dr. Rogers, I have watched your videos on diet many times. No added salt, no sea vegetables, and the only vitamin is B12. But I don't see any source of iodine. Is that safe? Uh, I think it's probably okay. The reason I say that is in the past, people would live in places called a goiter belt. They ate all their food locally, and some areas the soil is relatively depleted of iodine. But in the modern world, we tend to buy our food at a grocery store, and it comes from a wide variety of locations. And we usually get, you know, plenty of iodine in that in that way. So I sort of think this iodine deficiency crisis is exaggerated. And you know, it's the same old story. When somebody wants to sell something, they got to first convince, you know, the audience that they're deficient in it, and then they could sell it to them. You know, because there's all this hype about this or that iodine supplement. Do you personally take B12? I take B12. I take methylcobalamin. I would never take cyano. A lot of people say, oh, cyano. No, I wouldn't take that. You know what cyano stands for, okay? Well, cyanide, right? Yeah, exactly. I would never take that. Go, well, it's only a little bit. Well, yeah, you want to be taking that every day? No way. When well, you can take something else, methylcobalamin, okay? That's my attitude about it. Do you take it every day? No, I only take it about twice a month and my levels are fine. That I, I check it. I've titrated it by checking my levels. My levels are good and my energy is all great and stuff. So, so I'm happy. With, you know, it might be wise to take a small, but it's hard to buy it in small enough dosages if you're taking methylcobalamin, you know? So that's why I just take it a couple of times a month. And I found over time that that's worked well. So I just go with that. That's interesting. How, how often do you check your levels? About once every six months and they're always good. So I just, don't even bother with it. You know, and you don't worry about it. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Next question came from Kathy. Are there any foods that will make a 64 year old woman's skin stronger and help cure or manage senile purpura? I follow a vegan SOS free diet. I'm lean and fit. I don't take any medication. I supplement with vitamin B12 and D. 
Yeah, well, I basically think, you know, all this vegan stuff, it makes you have better perfusion. Part of what makes a person look youthful is that glow of vitality, which comes from better skin perfusion. So the plants have all the good stuff. They got more potassium. They, you know, P for plants, P for potassium. If you if you can just type into your browser, you know, uh, chemical structure of chlorophyll, and you'll see magnesium's right in the center of it. Sort of what what iron is to heme, hemoglobin in humans and animals is what magnesium is to chlorophyll. It's right in the center of it. So when you eat the plants, you get the chlorophyll, you get the magnesium. It's a vasodilator. And same thing with potassium. It's a vasodilator. The amount of uh, potassium in plants is, you know, 10 to 1 or even 101 uh, greater than the sodium versus in meat, and you might have a small increase in potassium relative to sodium, not much. In processed food, you'll have way more sodium than um, potassium. So you want to look at that ratio. You know, Richard Moore's book was all about this, and it's true. So if you just eat plant foods, you're going to get lots of the vasodilator. So those all things will give your skin that glow of vitality. In addition, you get the nitrate precursors from the greens. And we talked about that with Nathan Bryan and Dr. Esselstyn. You eat the nitrates in your greens. The top of your tongue, that's NO3, converts them to NO2 nitrites. They go to your stomach, and the stomach acid helps convert those to uh, NO nitric oxide. You get systemic vasodilation. Same thing when you walk out in the sun. You got subcutaneous precursors of the, the nitrates, and they then get converted to nitric oxide released through your blood. That's why it feels so good when you walk out in the sun. So walk out in the sun, eat your greens, eat the plants, and you're going to get better skin perfusion. Other things I would watch out for is watch out for F- minus in the water. F minus in the water can degrade collagen. It can intercalate into it and, and make it less functional. There's a guy by the name of John Yomamas. He's a biochemist. He wrote a book on it called Fluoride, the Aging Factor. And he felt that was a major uh, cause of accelerated aging. The other thing that's a cause of accelerated aging is glyphosate. Glyphosate, you, want to, you might want to call it that. But that is glycine phosphate, if you will. There's a little more to it than that, but that's the gist of the chemistry of it. And the point being is it's thought, Stephanie Seneth in particular has written a lot about this, that it can substitute for glycine um, in the process of protein synthesis. That's highly relevant because if you look at collagen, collagen is a scaffold of your entire body. And it's very important in your skin as well. Well, that is about 30% of all the proteins in your body. Every third amino acid is a glycine. And so if you're substituting glyphosate into there, you're damaging your collagen. And that's thought to be a mechanism of, you know, disrupting your collagen function throughout your body. In addition, you want to get your vitamin C, which you get from eating fruits and vegetables. You know, like remember the, the British sur uh, sailors, the limey, so to speak, did better when they ate limes. And, and the, what I'm trying to say is you get your vitamin C, humans don't make it uh, from eating all these plant foods. So you kind of optimize all the stuff for having good connective tissue uh, with your collagen. So that's how I would look about doing it. You know, I'm 60 years old. I got no medical problems. I look younger than all the doctors I know my age, 60 years of age. You know, I don't take any, I don't take anything. <laughs> I just, I'm like as simple as it could be. Uh, so anyways, those things are all helpful. And they'll say, be careful with your sun exposure. I don't want to get into all the details of it. Some people say, oh, you should stay out of the sun, use sunscreen. Well, like I said, you know, uh, out of the frying pan and into the, fry, the, the fire blade, the fire, there's, there's more toxins in sunscreen than you can imagine. So I never use sunscreen. I think it's dangerous, even though I know all the dermatologists recommend it. Well, I don't care. They haven't read about the, the estrogenic chemistry in it and the other the nanoparticles and all these other issues with it. Um, that's a whole separate talk. I should maybe give a talk about that one of these days, sunscreen, because it's, it's getting warm again, because it's much worse than people think it is. Wait, so you don't wear sunscreen? No, I would never wear sunscreen. Okay. Interesting. Because yeah, like my kid says, why don't you go to the beach with mom? I go, yeah, like I want to sit out in the sun all day, waste my whole day. I can go out in front of the house for 30 minutes and get the sun I need and then have my wife yell at me. You're lowering the property value. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Uh, next question from Nancy. Dr. Rogers, hi. Since you're an expert on the vascular system, I wanted to ask your opinion about veins. No one seems to talk at all about veins, only arteries. I've been whole food plant-based SOS free for the past year, and my reg regular lipid program profile is great. My problem is spider veins, which I'm assuming stem for a time before I was eating in a healthy way. My dermatologist told me she can easily eliminate these veins by injecting a substance, which will cause them to collapse. Do you think this is a safe thing to do? Am I likely to need these veins in the future? Well, there's a couple of ways to look at that. First one is I kind of did talk about it in this lecture with abdominal pressure syndrome. Somebody who's chronically constipated, you know, eating the low fiber diet, the stool is dry, they're, they're popping out goat pellets and Tootsie Rolls, so to speak, constantly straining at the stomach. That's called valsalva maneuver. The point being is that increase of abdominal pressure from straining at defecation is transmitted down into the leg veins and it causes constant back pressure on them. That will cause varicose veins and can cause your spider veins as well. So I would, by getting more fiber, 
you'll be less likely for that stuff to progress. That's number one. Uh, number two, should you get them injected? You could if you want, but you know, I've had about a million conversations in my life with guys about women. I never heard a guy say, well, I wouldn't want to sleep with her because she's got a spider vein on her leg. I mean, he wants to sleep with her or he doesn't. It's not going to change whether or not a guy wants to sleep with you, whether or not you have a spider vein on your leg. And by the time he's looking at that on your leg, he knows you pretty well anyways. So if, you know, for your own mind, if, if, if personally it matters to you a lot and you, and you walk around a lot in a bathing suit or shorts, that's your personal decision. You know, I don't have that much experience in, in, in injecting veins, so I don't know how well it works. I couldn't really answer that. Thank you. Okay, so this is from Victoria. Can a plant-based way of eating help a carotid artery ultrasound result positively to lower than a 50, per 50 percentile? My doctors tell me there's nothing I can do. They put fear into their comment. They're watching because we wouldn't want it to go up to 80% and have a stroke. For the past four years, while I've been eating no dairy or eggs, no oil, limited sugar and salt significantly instead of a vegetarian diet, I'm disappointed because the results have not improved lower than 50 percentile. I'm looked at as a 77-year-old kook. Of course, I'm grateful it hasn't worsened, but I don't understand why it hasn't improved. Yeah, there's always a trade-off for everything. And, you know, you could see if you get a change in the flow on ultrasound, ultrasound might show you a different uh, velocity there. If you're getting better vasodilatation, you're getting better intracranial vasodilation. Maybe you'll get an improvement, maybe you won't. But Esselstyn's work is pretty important. And Dean Ornish did a similar study with showing uh, prevention of progression and even some reversal of coronary artery disease. And the carotid artery in the neck, it basically goes from common carotid bifurcates into the internal and external. The external goes up to the face, the internal goes up into the brain. And what I'm basically saying is, it's been shown to be pretty good. And there's also animal studies. There are Armstrong animal studies. There's also the David Blankenhorn studies where he showed no matter what type of fat you eat, they all make atherosclerosis worse. So you should reduce your dietary fat. So that's all pretty good presumptive evidence of reasons to believe that fat lowering is very good for minimizing atherosclerosis. What else could you do? You could also want to have your hypertension under control. And that usually is done by lowering dietary fat, lowering dietary sodium, and eating more of these plant foods. You always have to be careful, though, too, when you change your diet, if you're taking medicines for um, atherosclerosis, uh, for high blood pressure, for diabetes, that your, your dosages are likely to need to be significantly decreased. You might even come off those medicines. So you have to work closely with your doctor to titrate things. Uh, but to the extent you can, it's usually... I would say it's just about always better to manage things by optimizing your diet, your lifestyle and whatnot um, than to be taking all these pills. Because when you ever take a pill, you're always between a little bit of a rock and a hard place, you know, like hypertension. If you're taking pills and you overtreat it, you drop your pressure to your head, you could have a hypotensive stroke, okay? Um, so you gotta be careful. But if you can't control it with diet and lifestyle, then the pill might be beneficial to you if you chronically have high, real high systolic, you know, maybe chronically over 150, I don't want to get into all the details of that, but that would be something that you would want it to be sure that it was a real thing, not just, uh, you know, white coat syndrome because you're nervous at the doctor's office. So what I'm basically saying is that's what I would do is I would try to do everything I could to optimize it. And, and none of this half, half butt stuff. A lot of people say things to me like I'm cutting down on my oil or my meat or my dairy. No, no, no. You, you quit completely. It has to be, I say like the 10 commandments, thou shalt not eat meat, thou shalt not eat dairy, thou shalt not eat oil. Because the people who, who just say I'm cutting down, they don't tend to have that good of an outcomes. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk about this a lot with so many of the guests. Most people don't do this and many want to do it, but they find it too difficult. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's that just like we have herbivore physiology, I think we tend to have herbivore brains in terms of how we think. Most people try to apply social thinking to nutrition and health, and that's a mistake. You know, for a herbivore animal, like an antelope, the safe place to be is the middle of the pack, okay? The last likely the lion is going to pick you off. But with health, it's not like that. Health thinking should be biblical. Thou shalt not eat meat. Thou shalt not eat oil. Thou shalt not eat dairy. Because that's what generates the best results. And people say, well, I'm not going to do that. Or my uncle would never do that. Well, fine, you know. You know, when it comes to health, just because you're a nice person doesn't mean you're not going to get coronary artery disease or these other diseases. You, 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 the proper attitude is what I would call an attitude of gratitude. I look around and I see endless disease, endless disasters, nonstop, okay? All day long, I see fatty liver, stroke, dementia, myocardial infarction, extensively calcified coronaries, 
and all the Westerners, they all get the same diseases. Okay. So what I say to myself is this is all I have to do is eat these low fat plant foods and you'll probably keep the Johnson working. You'll maintain your energy level. You maintain your cognitive function. Okay. I'm 60. Everything works. Okay. I know a lot of people in their twenties. I can't concentrate. I have brain fogs. My generation. The only thing we read is we, we watch shorts and we look at Twitter. We don't like long lectures. We don't like books. Okay. They're all getting dumbed down and stupid. Okay. I can concentrate 12 hours in a row, just fine day after day. And what I'm saying is you may, we, I actually had a, a medical student came to me for tutoring recently. Okay. And he kind of gave me this attitude, you know, well, that's weird. Regular people don't do that. You know, I gave, gave him these study advices and I'm like, look, do what I say. Just do what I say. And, and don't, you don't have to agree with it. Just do it for a while. And he's like, gee, he goes, I started eating better. He goes, I concentrate better. I don't have a headache. I don't feel pissed off. I go, well, that's a good start. Well, so what I'm trying to say is my advice would be try all this stuff for a couple months. You know, if you're on pills, titrate it with your doctor and you'd be surprised how you can a lot of times improve your function. I mean, there's no guarantee, but you don't know if you got any irreversible problems or if it's something else affecting you, but it's the way to go. I've been a doctor over 30 years and I can tell you the most powerful thing in all of medicine is this diet, nutrition, toxicology stuff. If it, you know, that's why I spent all this time with it. I don't even get any paid any money for this. I don't, I, my channel is not monetized. I, I just do it because it's the right thing. And I spent so much of my life. I kind of lived, you know, this monk things. I wish it was more of a joke than it is. My life has almost been like that a little bit. And I sort of feel like I didn't want to waste all that time. I sort of gave up everything else in life. I would have been happy as a wrestling coach. And I wanted to come for something. I want to be a great doctor. I want to do good. I want to help a lot of patients. I want to help a lot of people. And you just have to play the game for what it really is. And you're not going to get anywhere. You know, you don't win by, you know, lying to mother nature. You win by doing what mother nature wants you to do. Dr. Rogers, when you say you were tutoring somebody, what do you mean? Well, people will sometimes send students to me. Like there was a nursing student who was flunking out freshman year. A lot of times people are overwhelmed by anatomy and organic chemistry. And I basically say things to them like, look, think of school as a game. And it's a game of memorization. So if you want to do well in school, you got to be good at memorization. It's like a memory contest. So watch memory champions, okay? And learn study skills. And I also tell them to develop philosophy. Instead of feeling bitter, you know, why do I have to take this class? This class stinks. This teacher's a pain in the butt. I hate this class. You know, you, you should say things to like yourself. Try to fall in love with biology or whatever they can. There's a whole bunch of things a person can do. And in my opinion, they can routinely increase their IQ about 30 points, maybe more, 40 points. There's a lot of, I mean, we don't need to get into all the details of it because it's kind of a big subject, but people can dramatically improve their cognitive function. I wasn't even um, an honor student in high school. I wanted to be a wrestler. I was a jock, okay? And then I go, to, I get recruited to Stanford after I got an injury and the big 10 schools wouldn't recruit me no more. And um, I was scared I was going to flunk out. I got all B minuses, my first set of classes. And then I found this guy who's getting A pluses. I didn't want to flunk out. And I was also like wanting to redeem myself. I felt like I had failed because I got injured in wrestling. So I'm going to be trying to become good at school. And I just followed this guy. He's an A plus student. I go, what do you do? What do you do? How do you study? How do you study? How do you take notes? What do you do? I just copied everything he did. And I started reading all the study skills books. And what I'm saying is, I then got like A pluses, the most difficult classes. So there was no change in my brain. I didn't have brain surgery, a chip implant, or, or take anything. I just learned how to play the game. And so a person can dramatically improve their cognitive function, uh, but they have to be aware that you can. All the college guys who say you can't, they're wrong, okay? You can increase IQ. You simply look at all the individual components of IQ and you improve each one as much as you can. You might improve each little thing, two points here, two points here, two points here. You add that all up, you know, and you get a 30% 30 point increase. That's a big deal. So I think most people cognitively perform way below their potential. That is so cool. If I ever have to study for anything, I'll certainly ask you to tutor me. <laughs> I, I'd be happy to. It works. It, it, and it's all logical, too. It's just a bunch of systematic steps. Wow. Well, Dr. Rogers, this was really, really in interesting. You must spend hours preparing for these talks because- Well, it's cool. kind of fun for me. You know, it's kind of like I'm an old guy, you know, and uh, my kids are grown up. You know, my wife works a lot. I sit around and I think about things and I'm like, this is good or this is funny. And- um, so I like doing it. And also I sort of feel like I've kind of reached, you know, this level of knowledge where people actually, you know, are interested to hear what I have to say. So I might as well do it. You know, what else am I going to do? I don't know. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Thank you. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Healing Spices, part 11 with Dr. Sunil Pai. We're going to be talking about sage, sesame seeds, star anise, and sun-dried tomatoes. Take care, everyone, and thanks for watching.